Recording in progress. The hour of 5.30 having arrived, the clerk will call the roll. Thank you, Mayor. We have Planning Commissioner Dan. Gordon. Here. Kennedy. Here. McKelvey. Here. Thompson. Here. <clears throat> Vice Chair Paul Hamas is absent tonight, and Chair Conway is absent. Councilmember Newsom? Present. Brown? Here. Watkins? Here. Brunner? Present. Valentari Johnson? Present. Vice Mayor Golder? Here. Mayor Keeley? Here. A quorum having been established, we will begin our joint meeting of the Santa Cruz City Council and the Santa Cruz City Planning Commission. Uh, if I could make some brief opening remarks and then we will get to the staff presentation and council and and commissioner comments on the plan and invite the public also to participate in this study session um, i think it's fair to say uh, that we welcome our planning commissioners our friends our colleagues who do an awful lot of work for our city uh, in a very rapid changing environment with the state laws changing so rapidly, requirements changing rapidly, and uh, you folks are doing very good work, and we appreciate it because what you work your way through and then send forth to us uh, through your advice role is, is enormously valuable to us. Uh, Having you look at these items, whether they are policy or individual development proposals, uh, with the keen eye and, and high level of ethics that you apply to these uh, matters, we, we on the City Council very much appreciate that. And we're so happy that you are here this evening and that we will jointly examine the downtown expansion plan. So thank you all, first of all, very, very much. Our planning staff. Uh, who uh, Lee Butler and his team, uh, Sarah and all of Bill who is here, all of the folks who, and Matt, all of the folks who participate in this exercise through our planning department, through our economic development department, the city attorney's office and others, uh, we are enormously grateful to all of you as well. This is very, very good work served up and, and we appreciate it. I would like to begin <clears throat> by saying a couple of other things. One is uh, what this is and what this is not. Uh, this is an attempt to take the policy of the city and try to operationalize that through a downtown expansion plan. In early 2023, this city council, by unanimous vote, established what we are managing towards downtown. That is not an issue here or at any other meeting we're going to have. We already know what we're doing. What we're doing is we are trying to operational plan, operationalize a plan which says no building will be taller than 12 stories. We'll have 1,600 units downtown, and 20% of all of those units will be affordable in the various affordability categories as defined by the state and federal governments. That's our plan. What we're now thinking about is how do we operationalize that? How do we do that parcel by parcel, area by area? How do we make that really happen through a series of complementary public policies? That, I think, is what our discussion's about. We will receive information on that tonight, and that's what we are seeking from you, planning commissioners, as well as city council members. We are seeking your advice and counsel on how we will make that happen, not whether we should make that happen or it should be some other number of stories or some other number of you. We're a year and a half past that point of discussion and conversation. So tonight will be a study session on a couple of things. One is the planning department's very good work on this uh, and they will go through it in some detail. And then we are seeking your advice and counsel, everyone who's in this meeting, including the public. But being very clear that what we're seeking your input on is how to operationalize and bring about what I call the 12-16-20 plan, 
12 stories, 1,600 units, 20% affordable. So again, thank you all for being here. Uh, thank the planning department. Thank you good folks for being part of this. And I'm now going to ask the planning department to begin your presentations. And Mr. Butler, thank you so much for your good work. Thank you, Mayor Keeley, and good afternoon, council members and planning commissioners. I'm Lee Butler, Director of Planning and Community Development for the city. And as the mayor mentioned, um, we have been uh, working on how we will implement the direction that we have from the city council from January of 2023. So it's been um, about uh, 15 months or so since we've been in front of you and we're happy to bring a draft plan before you today. Um, Matt Van Waugh, our principal planner in advanced planning and Sarah Noisy have been working diligently with um, our consultant Bill Wiseman on um, putting together that draft plan. And we're gonna present the overview of that to you this evening so that um, we can get that feedback um, and they can talk to you about the, the contents of the plan. Um, just some, some logistics, they're gonna go through um, some of the uh, certain, they're gonna go through parts of the plan and then open it up for questions from the uh, commissioners and from the council members and then uh, continue on to the next part. And um, if it pleases the mayor, um, then we will, um, have public comment following all of those questions and then open it up to the uh, planning commissioner and then council member comments and uh, feedback on the plan. So um, that's the approach that we uh, that we discussed and um, Mayor, if you'd like to handle it any other way, that's your prerogative. <laughs> um, I will go ahead and share my screen here now and turn it over to Matt. Mr. Van Waugh, good evening, welcome. Hey, good evening, Mayor, Vice Mayor, and uh, Chair, Planning Commission. Thank you very much, Matt Van Waugh, Principal Planner for Advanced Planning. I am stepping in for Sarah Noisy today. Uh, she couldn't be with us, but she is online in case we need to speak with her. So we'll begin. So I'm, I'm here with uh, Bill Wiseman as well, who is with uh, Kimley Horn, our consultant on the project. So our agenda for tonight, Lee, Lee had mentioned a little bit, uh, we have some downtown plan background and then a review of the draft downtown plan, which includes these three sections, community spaces, streetscapes and circulation and proposed floor area ratios and the increased affordable housing overlay. And those are the three sections where we'll stop for clarifying questions, comments, and then following that discussion. So as you know, uh, background, uh, the downtown specific plan uh, came about in 1991 following the recovery of the earthquake and has been update, updated several times since, most recently in the late uh, 2010s, uh, where we increased height uh, for residential uses in the core of the downtown. And you know, we really see the effects of that today. There, that, those small height changes did spur uh, new development in the area, which really significantly helped uh, increase our, our housing in the city. Uh, in this project, to expand the downtown, expand upon those successes of the, the recent uh, work on the plan uh, was partially funded by state grant funding uh, with the goals to increase housing capacity and support further economic opportunity in the area. And so project context, you'll see in the blue is our current downtown plan and the green is our beach and south of Laurel plan and the red is our project area, where it's taking a, a small portion of that beach in south of Laurel area, uh, directly south of our existing downtown. And so this south of Laurel area district, uh, it's about 29 acres. You can see it just in a little more detail here. And uh, here's a photo, for instance, too, with the Casa Permanente Arena and uh, several of the other blocks captured there. Uh, we're looking, we're looking uh, west from uh, the Laurel Bridge there. And so 
we've, we've been to council and planning commission several times for feedback throughout the, the two and a half, three years we've been working on this now. Uh, one key uh, meeting in particular I just wanted to highlight was a meeting in January 2023 where we received further council direction um, on this 12-16-20 plan as the mayor mentioned uh, uh, doing what we can to keep the area to 12 stories uh, to 1,600 units. Uh, while we are studying 1,800 units in the EIR to give us some leeway just in case. Uh, that's the environmental impact report for CEQA. And a 20% affordable uh, <coughs> inclusive of density bonus. So we've also done a lot of community outreach uh, throughout this process. It started in November 2021 with a workshop followed by a survey, and then we had a large open house in April of 2022. And then in uh, the fall of 2023, we had a, an, a second community survey that had a, about 1,100 responses, uh, which was really significant and gave us a lot, of great, uh, a lot of great feedback. And following that, we did some really specific focus group work as well to get some, to further dial in some of the responses that we heard from that survey. And just to give you a brief flavor of that survey, uh, we asked certain things about like ground floor uses, how supportive or not supportive are you? Uh, the general, uh, and we talked about ground floor, we talked about pedestrian and bicycle circulation, uh, traffic, uh, design, uh, ground floors, any number of things. Um, and what we, gen what we found was generally there's a lot of support for many of the things that are in the plan currently. Um, and you can go into a lot more detail on this on our, on our website. We have a significant uh, summary of this survey report, uh, as well as we, we also, at the end of this survey, uh, we allowed people to provide uh, you know, general comments on the plan as well. And uh, those general comments also, we actually used a, like an AI uh, program to, to sift through them and, and figure out what was uh, you know, supportive and not supportive, for instance. Of, of the plan in general, and there's uh, a majority support, uh, most certainly. Uh, so that was, that was exciting to see through that survey and, and the 1,100 responses. So here's just a few other examples. Um, and you can go and you can see there's about 16, 17 questions that go into a lot of quantitative detail uh, online. And so Throughout this plan too, uh, since 2021, we've been working with project objectives, and those were adding capacity for multifamily housing, creating opportunities for public amenities and infrastructure, uh, better connecting the downtown with the river and beach, uh, creating new economic opportunities, generating new tax revenue to support city services, uh, improving the pedestrian and bicycle experience, and incorporating uh, a permanent warriors arena into the plan. And just for instance, one of our survey questions that I just had mentioned uh, asked people to rank these. And uh, the number one was creating opportunities for public amenities infrastructure. And number two was adding capacity for multifamily housing. And so throughout this whole process, since we've gathered uh, you know, a lot of feedback from council and planning commission and this various community outreach work, we are now at the place where there's a draft downtown plan incorporating all this feedback. And uh, just to explain that further, there's, there's kind of two parts to how we, how we had to do this draft plan. Uh, we have the, an appendix to our existing plan, uh, Appendix 8, which is what it's called. Um, and that focuses on the public improvements, parks, streets, circulation, things like that, that are more in the, the, the public the public realm. And then we also have uh, amendments to our existing downtown plan, which really build on the existing uh, design standards, uh, building standards, uh, things like that, um, that are more specific to uh, development projects. And so we have those two pieces of the plan and we'll I'll have Bill come up here and walk you through the, the public space aspect of that, public space and streets. And then I'll follow up the, the conversation, again, going back to standards, heights, things like that. Take it away, Bill. Thank you. Mr. Wiseman, good afternoon. Good evening, rather. Welcome. Thank you all. Um, I just want to note that at the end of last year, I retired. After 
<laughs> but I want to say that there's a few projects that um, I am consulting back on, and this is the number one project. So thank you. The ability to work in my community on a project of this magnitude, they take time, as many big projects I've worked on, it's to be expected. But uh, I'm, it's a real pleasure for me and professionally rewarding to be able to work on a project that's significant. When I was 18, I went walking down the mall, fresh from Virginia out here to California, and I was like, I'm at home. <laughs> it, was, it was a memory. So, uh, so anyhow, to be able to work on downtown here, is, it's a real pleasure. So Thank you, sir. Appreciate being here. OK, so I'm going to focus on uh, the components of really the community spaces. So um, the real essence of this project is to be able to create a community space and a gathering space and, and a social interaction. It's using that public realm to be able to create some excitement. And I kind of think of it as an entertainment district in the context of you have the Warriors and you have an arena, which acts as an anchor. And so the whole goal that we've been working with, with the city and, and the architects and, and the Warriors, et cetera, is to think about how the public realm, the community spaces works, and what we can do to enhance that and really make a draw and extend that downtown down into this area and make the whole downtown a vibrant area. And then ultimately also connecting that with the, with the beach um, area. So what I'm going to do is go through, and this first slide uh, just shows you conceptually what the plan is about. I'm going to give a couple context issues about um, what you're seeing in blue and uh, what some of the graphics are. And then I'm going to go into seven different community space areas and talk a little bit about what the design is, is and the intent, and then just summarize a few of the policies. So largely, this is a policy document in the context it sets the framework, because there's not a specific design itself, but there's a framework by which it could be used in the future, so that as development comes online, there's a reference for city staff and the public, et cetera, and going through design process that says, OK, this is the vision um, that, that, is, that we're looking to go forward with. So those areas in blue translate to what we call the redevelopment block. So these letters will get used in the future. So it's important to just have a context of, um, of what, uh, what we envisioned right for redevelopment. Those areas that are gray but still within the, the um, South of Laurel area are areas, for example, 555 uh, Pacific. It's a new building. It's not going to get developed over the next 20 or 30 years. And other parcels are not in, included. Uh, be them for their size or, or age or other other factors. So, so and A, B, C, and D are really the core. So it's important to kind of get a memory or visual on, on those four because that really is is the heart and soul of this uh, project area. The other thing to set the context that then defines the framework for the project is the existing and proposed circulation. And there's um, three major components that are the deltas, if you will, between the existing, which you're seeing in the lower right, and then the larger image of what's being proposed. The first is Spruce Street, which is our east-west, which connects from Pacific out to the Santa Cruz, excuse me, the Santa Cruz River Walk and the San Lorenzo River. Uh, you'll see what's being proposed there is to basically close the entire street. Um, there's a dotted line between Pacific and front, um, so it's sort of some little flexibility, but ultimately the idea is to create a connection between Pacific Avenue and the river. Um, the other part is to really open up the river and create much better access to it. So there, at present, Laurel Street extension extends from Spruce Street south and goes basically down river. And that's prime real estate. So why not think about how we could open that up and utilize that, that interface of the buildings and whatnot and uh, not have a roadway that's bisecting it. So the plan is what's called the Laurel Street Extension, which is the, the dark line that you see at the bottom there. Basically, uh, a narrow roadway, still providing the same access, uh, but tucked along Beach Hill so that cars can, can circulate in there. And then that opens up um, the whole, basically blocks the, I can mix things up, easterly side of blocks B and D uh, with the river interface. And then the last component of this to focus in on is a roundabout at the intersection of Front Street and Pacific. So that's, we already have the, the depot uh, roundabout. The idea is to create another roundabout up there in an area where there's a lot of conflict. It's a, it's a, it's a tough area. It's a little bit unsafe. And the idea is to create a, a roundabout there and also has, has, have that serve as a gateway, basically a, an entrance that says, ah, you've arrived. So something substantial that's visually 
reinforces the, the southern entrance. So the seven community spaces that we're going to kind of drill in on are listed here, um, one through seven, and I'm going to go through each of these and talk a little bit about each one. So the first is Spruce Street Plaza. So that's what connects from Pacific Avenue um, across to uh, the Santa Cruz River. The idea here is to, to one, to actually widen the, the built form so that you have a bigger space, so some building setbacks, and then to create this plaza that's really vibrant and really the heart and soul of the entire um, Sola area, Sola district. Um, this can be a place that's basically creating a community plaza for community events. It's an outflow, uh, pre and post arena events. Um, it can be for uh, other types of events such as food truck, uh, trying to get my notes here, food truck gathering, outdoor markets, et cetera. So really this becomes holiday events. This becomes the, the core by which people can, can gather. And by widening that space out, you can get up to about 4,000 people that could fit into this space. So it could become you know, really a, a symbolic center for not just the city, but really for the, the region. Um, some of the policies relating to this are uh, basically to, to close it to, to traffic, to utilize high quality materials, provide extensive seating and special lighting and interactive features and art. So creating that vibrant space. And this is just another image of, of, for context of what we're trying to create there. And I think what's important to think about is, you know, I've gone down to this arena many times, and it largely, you know, there's not a lot of activity that goes on there, particularly during the day. And so thinking about that plaza and creating it so it has a much more vibrant and much more, I won't say 24-7, but certainly 12-7 or whatever the right number is, you know, that it has activity far beyond just when there's an arena event, I think would be really critical. Okay, next uh, community space is the Santa Cruz River Walk. Uh, there's a cross section here, so this is what we talked about with moving the Laurel Street extension, so that basically creating a space. Um, and the important thing here is the interface between blocks B and D, how those buildings function, uh, how they relate to the levee, and then how the circulation occurs uh, on the levee itself. So um, looking at the cross section there, or the, the plan view, you see enhanced paving, and so that is an area where You've got some sort of interface with the buildings, and maybe they're cafes or restaurants or whatever. But in other words, there's an interface with the buildings. There's a separated um, pathway for bikes, so there's, it's serving as a throughput. And then you have a pedestrian pathway and, and levees, excuse me, uh, next to the levee. Some of the policies, in addition, that I want to note are maintaining solar access to the greatest extent possible because you're right next to the river. And the other thing is to cre consider creating design solutions to better utilize the land associated with the um, storm pumps that are on the north side of Block B. So right now there's a very important piece of infrastructure there, but it's fenced in barbed wire and you know there's maybe some opportunities to use the airspace or something creative to basically open up that very, very valuable land. It's also right where as you're coming across and Matt showed that photo um, coming across Laurel Street Bridge. When you take that turn and you're coming down Laurel Street Bridge, that's what you're going to see right there. So it's an important opportunity there that uh, if we can do something with that, I think it'll be really, really a, a great success. Pacific Avenue, uh, essentially the idea is really make this an extension of what's already there north of Pacific Avenue. So that character of a, of a wide sidewalks, uh, well landscaped, lots of amenities. Uh, there's policies related to encouraging uh, restaurant and outdoor use. Um, also being able to close uh, on some occasions on a temporary basis to be able to close the road off. So maybe a series of bowl bollards or something like that so that it can serve as really an extension of the Spruce Street Plaza for certain events. You've got that access as well. So you can really open up and create a lot even more space for that. Uh, next is Front Street. So Front Street still is going to need to function in the context of its uh, volumes for traffic because it is the main connector between the downtown and the beach area. So recognizing that it's still going to have, uh, uh, you know, just needs to accommodate transit and truck traffic, et cetera. 
um, but still keeping uh, at least a wider sidewalk notion there, minimizing the number of driveways so that there isn't a lot of conflict, um, encouraging uh, drop-off zones, so depending on where the arena goes, and I'll get to that a little bit later, um, the place to, to pick up and drop off for vehicles uh, is, is part of the context here. Mainly focused then on, on design and street, streetscape changes, but not functional changes is kind of the theme there. Uh, Laurel Street Extension. Uh, I, I kind of envision Laurel Street Extension in the future as this little shady hideaway, if you will. It's going to have a one-lane road, great spot for a bookshop and an overflow or cafe or something with nice foliage. You've got the, the Beach Hill Cliff on one side and buildings on the other. I think it could be a, quite a memorable space um, if it's designed well. So that's kind of the idea here with uh, what can happen within this sort of an, an intimate part of, quiet part of downtown, a place to meet up and say, hey, I'll meet you over the extension and well, we can have a conversation. <laughs> um, one of the keys here is on relocation because here, as well as other residential areas within the plan, there is a policy that says the realignment shall only shall only occur after the relocation of the residents and closure of the Front Street residential care facility. And this is, has to be consistent, as it's written, with city and state regulations. So there's regulations in place, and the city is actually, I understand from talking with Lee earlier today, to actually expand on those regulations. But I think it's important to note that anywhere within the planning area, there are regulations that will protect for relocation requirements. So there's a, there's a rigid process for that. And this one is particularly important given the, uh, the residents that are there. Uh, Pacific Avenue and Front Street, the roundabout that I talked about. Um, there's policies in there, first off, to provide separated bike and pedestrian, so one way, so really making sure that it functions well for, for bikes and pedestrians. Uh, the idea of creating some sort of significant feature within the center, be it landscaping or art or combination, et cetera, with some landscaping enhancements, really being able to sort of slow the circulation down so it's safe, and also the idea of a memorable gateway entrance. So the, last, uh, the last is on the arena. Um, so just for context, right now the arena seats uh, about 2,500 permanent and about 3,100 uh, permanent and temporary. And it would increase by about 25 to 30 percent. So it would be 3,200 fixed seat and 4,000 fixed and temporary. So that's the, that's the framework by which we're working with and talking with the Warriors. Um, so replacement of that building, also it would have some ancillary uses. They would want to have a second practice court. There would be locker rooms, a gym administrative, et cetera. So really trying to create a state-of-the-art arena for or, yeah, arena for the Warriors, but also designing it so that it can be multi-use for lots of other different um, uh, venues. Uh, the, at present, the document identifies, because it's not known yet, the arena could be on either Block C or Block D. Block D is where the uh, temporary arena is at the, at the moment. So. There's some design considerations that go on for how that's going to work. As far as policy standpoints, uh, some keys are for either block is to really make sure that it's user friendly and facing out in a positive way onto the Spruce Street Plaza. That interface is going to be really critical. So the design of that's going to be important. And uh, additionally, if it is on block D, there's that interface with the river walk itself and how those interfaces, or excuse me, how that, how that, that interaction occurs. Um, the only other thing, no, that's all I want to say on that. <laughs> okay, so with that, this is the first of three pause points, if you will. And the idea is if any, if there's clarifying questions because there's a lot of, of content, or, you know, we don't want people to forget, so we'll pause and uh, back to the mayor and we'll go from there for the questions and I'll come back. Thank you. I think what I'll do if it works for both bodies here is I'll start here with Ms. Gordon, work my way all the way around. Next time, we're going to start in the other direction, move our way around. Everybody okay with that? We're good? Ms. Gordon, good evening. Thank you for your service. So um, <laughs> I'm actually a little distracted by this other person that's up here on the screen. I don't know there's 
Oh, yeah, okay. So, um, sorry, I was a little caught off guard by. <laughs> doing fine. So, um, I think, well, I don't, I, I think my questions are probably gonna come up in a little bit more depth. So, I think I might, I might pass for, okay. yeah. Council Member Brenner, good evening. Thank you. Thank you, Bill Weisman, for presenting those um, community spaces thus far. And uh, thank you to everyone who has submitted input thus far. We've received emails and um, input as well. So um, putting it all together, my clarifying questions um, relate to this. I'll, I'll go in, in my order here. The Spruce Street Plaza and um, how between Front Street and Pacific Avenue, there is a residential driveway there. How, how, would, that, how would that work? So um, I think the way I would answer that is that when redevelopment occurs, the phases will be a little bit challenging. That's why these things take so long. But it probably, I would envision that you basically have a clean slate. And so that to redesign that street would take a, a complete redoing. It's not something that's incremental. So where you see a driveway now, it may not exist or probably most likely wouldn't exist in the context of a master planning redevelopment. I'll just add as well, just to clarify that that residential driveway you mentioned, that that was between Front and Pacific, right? Okay. Uh, as we as we our current proposal, we're we're assuming that the the arena is most likely going to go on Block D ad adjacent to the river, and in that scenario, we're currently proposing just the the portion of spruce between Front and the river be pedestrianized so it only change if it, it at this point right now our, our current draft plan shows only that portion pedestrianized but if the if the arena were to go on that block c between uh pacific and front then then we would want to consider uh pedestrianizing that portion of spruce as well just given arena spill out events community events things like that so for everyone to keep in mind that these are conceptual ideas based on input from the surveys and other uh, meetings and what's existing there may or may not be part of the plan. This isn't a workaround with some of the existing infrastructure necessarily. Is that? Yeah, correct. Some, some portions of this will certainly be phased in over a longer time than others and be based on development or or our you know capital uh, capital funding things like that okay and um so my thank you that that's helpful my second question was around metro transit and shuttle stops and how that that is incorporated into the, the conceptual plan with the community spaces um, and I see Claire Glogley coming forward with that. Hi, I'm Claire, Transportation Planner and Public Works. Um, we are closely coordinating with Metro on all things as we move forward. And this is another case where as this development were to occur, we would look at where the existing transit stops are and if there's an opportunity to move them to better serve the development that we were seeing. Um, in the near term, there's no plans to change transit service. I could see if uh, the arena was on a different parcel than it is now, maybe wanting to orient a improved transit stop at that location to facilitate people getting to and from games and other um, housing opportunities. Great. And um, I noticed you used the term entertainment district. Um, and in some of the, the agenda, documents there was reference to arts district and um, I just wonder at what point in the process those terms um, I guess become 
more um, determined and how that gets determined. I know, for example, the, the Tannery Art Center is working on um, becoming um, an arts district. And um, so I just, in, in looking at the whole picture of the city and context of everything around um, thinking about how this, the relationship of this new updated neighborhood relates with its neighboring neighborhoods. And um, so I don't, I don't know if that's a clarifying question um, that can be answered, but maybe at what point in the process I know that that, that question has come up when that gets to that point. Yeah, thank you for that. We, we have started to engage with the, the arts community as well as our economic development department as well on, on thinking about the, the future of this area. There's certainly a lot more work to do in that regard. I, I see it more as like a, a phase two uh, because we do need to do a lot further outreach to that community and, and to the community at large when we're thinking about what kind of art spaces uh, and public spaces can, can be like in this area. Um, so we don't we don't have those specifics yet and what what public art might go into the plan or, or how it can become an arts district in the future if if that's what the community decides but uh, given given the you know the potential for a new arena and you know con you know concerts and other kind of community events that can happen in that area there's certainly a synergy to build on uh, so I, I could see in the future as as this plan comes to fruition there I think there's gonna be more and more momentum to create some kind of district like that in the future. I think that's helpful, and I think um, for everyone who's also asking those questions, this is still at, at a more high level, conceptual community spaces could work in this way on these parcels, and all those logistics are still in the process, and Correct. this is an ongoing process, so that's helpful. Thank you. Thank you. Councilmember Kalantari Johnson is recognized. Thank you. I have no clarifying questions at this Vice point. Vice Mayor is recognized. Thank you. I just have two quick ones. When you're looking at Front Street, I, you said it was going to still be two ways. After the roundabout, when it goes, goes towards Pacific, is that still two ways, or is that one way I couldn't tell from the... Um... Two ways, and I think the next section gets into more detailed circulation also. Okay, thank you. And then my other follow-up question, and I know that um, you've been in talks with the county, I think they run that residential facility, but has there been any talk, and I don't know how many years out all of these plans are, but as new um, um, permanent supportive housing comes online at Coral Street, is there talk about help collaborating with Housing Matters and helping relocate um, residents there at this point, or is that too soon? Thanks for that question, Vice Mayor Golder. Um, so that is a specialized population at um, that location, and um, the county has, uh, and the conversations that we've had have been looking at um, providing a, a new facility um, that would accommodate that. Um, there has been some thought about um, Coral Street um, accepting that, but that hasn't um, that hasn't risen as you know, the, the preferred alternative at this point. So um, the development team um, and the county and the city have had a number of conversations because we recognize that um, that is a, a key component of being able to relocate that roadway network. Thank you. Councilmember Watkins is recognized. Thank you, Mayor. Um, thank you for the presentation and overview. I had one just question I wanted to know, because I didn't really see it explicitly stated in the agenda report or the appendix, in that how is parking contemplated, given state laws really undermining the ability for us to require parking, yet we're having a draw location specifically with the Warriors, so... Hi, I'll uh, also ping that Gavin's online, our parking programs manager. So if you have further questions, uh, let me know. Currently, this area is outside of our downtown parking district. And so any um, benefits that you see currently in the district with a shared parking model and our structures and the ability for permits 
don't carry forward to this zone at this time. The thinking that we have is that state law gives um, developers the opportunity to develop a higher number of units in these transit supportive zones and with these affordability guidelines. And one of the benefits of doing that is not having to provide parking on site. What goes hand in hand with that is the assumption that on the private side, developers will provide as much parking as they think is needed. One of the questions that we have had internally is what's the city's role in providing parking in this area and subsidizing uh, vehicular travel rather than thinking about straightscape design. At this time, we do not own parcels for parking in this area. Um, and so it's an area I'd love to hear some feedback on from you. Well, I think we need parking down there. <laughs> there's, there's a little bit of feedback. If you talk to anybody who goes to the Warriors, they are really struggle to get parking. So if we're designing this for our entire county and region to be an attraction, um, my parents come from Aptos, right? Like, they're going to need to find somewhere to park. So however we're contemplating that moving forward, I would just share that as an important criteria. Um, the other thing I, and I don't know if Tiffany's here, is just there was sort of reference of environmental review, and I'm wondering what sort of has been put into thought around that, given the kind of the flood hazard and um, risk area for, you know, climate change. And I know it's sort of referenced in kind of the other plan components, but what's the next steps, I guess, with some of the environmental considerations is the question. Yeah, thank you for that. We uh, we do have a, a next step slide that goes into detail on that at the end, but I'll just give you a briefly um, the the next steps once we've heard feedback from Council and Planning Commission and community members uh, into July here. Uh, we're going to take that feedback, refine the plan further, and once that plan's refined, we're going to have a, a really good idea of what to start our environmental CEQA process around. And so this summer, we're going to be undertaking that uh, environmental impact report process. Uh, we've already started that. We've been working uh, on, you know, uh, traffic simulations and things like that already, uh, uh, given where we're at. But we're going to be finishing the, uh, the EIR this, this summer into fall. And then there'll be another public review process through, through that EIR process where uh, people can, can review that document make further comments, and then we respond to those uh, into the into the winter of this year. And so so the things that you mentioned, you know, flood zone, other environmental impacts, uh, those will those will not only be taken into account in this document, but also uh, there will still be CEQA done on a project-to-project -project basis as, as projects come in. So there will be, you know, a further a further refinement of, of looking in those specific project impacts uh, as projects come in. Great. Thanks. I guess as it relates to community spaces, maybe we can think about it also with that consideration in terms of shading and, you know, pleasant experiences for people with all different weather conditions, I guess. Um, and then the other thing is there was a picture of like, a, you know, in the Spruce Street area for families. And I just want to encourage that as something that remains in the plan. I don't think there's a lot of spaces downtown where you can kind of feel comfortable letting your kids just run around. And I don't know if you've been to Los Gatos, like there's a little spot where you can kind of like mm -hmm. close the fence and they're good and you're out kind of um, able to enjoy outside eating and still observe. And however, we can think about that as we're thinking about community spaces. I, I really think that's important. So anyways, that's, I'll leave my question. Thank you. That, that That's a great point. I just want to mention we've also been working, coordinating quite closely with our parks department through this as well. And and they agree. I think I think we're all hoping to have, uh, I don't know if you've been to Boulder, uh, Colorado, like the Pearl Street, yeah, where yeah. they have like really built in things into the street that are that are interactive and, and fun for a lot of ages. Uh, you know, thinking more about that stuff, how that can come into the plan. Uh, we'll see what comes of that. Parks and public spaces will certainly be a, a future component of this and thinking about those exact details, uh, but it is something we're thinking about. Great. And I think to Councilmember Bruner's point around consulting the art community and consulting, you know, youth and families and teens and all people, people of all ages would be great information to inform how to move forward. So anyways, thank you. Thank you. Councilmember Brown is recognized. Thank you, Mayor, and thank you for the presentation. Your enthusiasm is evident and um, contagious. Um, I'm excited uh, about the possibilities here. I, um, I'm going to ask a question that is not necessarily, well, it's 
it will help clarify for me. I, it, I don't know that it's a clarifying question. And I recognize that we are in conceptual phase. I recognize that the plan, at least in, as I've read it, um, includes a recognition that an impact fee will be required and that new revenues are expected to help cover the costs uh, for the additional services that are going to be needed and, and infrastructure. But what I see is um, really significant infrastructure costs. And so I'm just wondering conceptually, at least, how you are thinking about the kind, how we're going to raise the capital needed to make these kinds of ma major changes. Ms. Lipscomb, good evening. Welcome to the council meeting. Good evening, Mayor, Council Members, Commissioners. Um, so we have been looking at the infrastructure costs and recognize that those costs are great for the district. We've been, we've contracted with Cosmont and we're looking at a variety of financing strategies. The main one we're focusing on initially is an enhanced infrastructure financing district which is sort of like a redevelopment 2.0. Um, and that is voluntary um, by the city and potentially voluntary by the county if they would like to participate. And it's at varying levels of participation. So you can um, dedicate you know, 25%, 50%, of future growth. So it sets the base year that all continues to the general fund and then a percentage of that over the base year that's based on the projected development in there is dedicated to the district. And so off that, we could bond or potentially finance. We could also layer a community facilities dif district with that, tax sharing agreements. There's a variety of different funding mechanisms that we're looking at um, to contemplate the, um, the heavy load of public infrastructure and some of the um, amenities that we would like to see in the area. Uh, I think that's all I got for now. Council Member Newsom is recognized. Uh, thank you, Mayor. I have no questions at the moment. <clears throat> Commissioner Thompson, good evening. Good evening. Um, uh, I uh, focused my attention reviewing the, the draft on the, the, the dimensions, the size of things, how, how wide are sidewalks and, <laughs> and like that. And, uh, and I, I like uh, the plan. I think it's got the dimensions right. Um, the one place that I think um, can use some elaboration is um, where the sidewalk meets the building. Because right now, um, it's just drawn as if the sidewalk comes up and meets the building. But um, in fact, we like to have some planting often between our buildings and the sidewalk. And uh, I'm not comfortable with the notion that the planting then subtracts from the sidewalk width. So we might um, uh, uh, provide more direction for um, how we can get landscaping um, uh, at the building um, without sacrificing the side sidewalk width. Thank you, sir. Further? Commissioner McKelvey, good evening, sir. Good evening. Thank you for the presentation and all the work over several years now. <clears throat> this is a marathon, not a sprint, but I've got a few things. Um, there was a statement made early on in the presentation about the necessity for keeping front as a major thoroughfare, and I'm wondering if that's based on metrics that have been calculated or whether it is a uh, goal that, that I'm not aware of. Yeah, no, thank you for that question. What we think of um, is a transportation network, and so we look in this area, and there are some areas that we need to have be flow streets and some areas that we want to be slow streets, more people-centered. Front Street is one of the, and really our choices between getting from downtown north-south are really front and Pacific there. The choice we made here was, as you'll see, I think in the next section when we get through some cross-sections, yeah. mm -hmm. and we'll get into that in a little more detail, so I'll give the high level and then if you have further questions we can get more into it then. But really looking at where do we want vehicles and transit to be, and where do we want to orient more towards people spaces? And in that choice, Front had the higher transit utilization, has more truck volumes, and has more vehicular needs on it. So in making those choices in our hierarchy of where people go, that was the direction that we were going. What I, what I see in the plan is that it's kind of a, a 
an attempt to slow it down in front, in, on Front Street, and it kind of works against that goal a little bit. And, and I see that that uh, cruciform shape of the streets there, I love the connection to Spruce, I love the continuation, the connection to the water, but uh, it's, it really kind of balkanizes the space that's available for development and creates, it, it could be a great connection, but it also is a, it kind of hamstrings what the options are. And particularly as regards the connection to the river and kind of making that a linear uh, piece that may need a little more room. Um, that's kind of where that's coming from. So I'd love to hear more about. Okay, I would say hold it when we get to cross sections and great. then we'll get in some detail of it. Great. Um, To skip over those. Um, I, one thing that we haven't really talked about, and I think is just one of my favorite parts of this plan, is the connection of kind of the 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 terminus of the river walk at Cliff Street, and then the connection down to the waterfront. Because I, I walk that area quite a bit. It's it could be I think a really beautiful part of this plan, and I think also that in terms of the goal of connecting the downtown to to the beach the pedestrian and we want to pedestrianize i just think every opportunity we can take to make that connection from this area down to the waterfront is really important to pay attention to <clears throat> and then i've just got to say that i think some parking underground would be terrific i don't, I don't for an event-based, you know, I, I see, I see festivals, you know, out on the riverfront there, and I would love to see, you know, people could be from out of the area, might not just be community members. I'd like to see that kind of draw and being able to accommodate them. So, thank you, sir, Commissioner Kennedy. Good evening. I remember being so thrilled by the kind of section at the big study session down at the current Warriors Stadium. And so I wondered if you could just go back and uh, give me an update on how that's evolved. The thing I saw then was how the streets kind of rose up to the river walk level slowly and steadily. So I think that's still happening, but could you just like, you know, do a little hand waving and show us how that's going to work? This is a section question too, by the way, but as yeah. the streets. Well, and, and uh, we, we didn't put all the sections on the slide because we'd be on the slideshow because we'd be here all night <laughs> and get go down the rabbit hole. But in context to what you're saying, there would have to be some grade separation, how that occurs and where it occurs from going east to west. Uh, the plan recognizes it and leaves it open. Again, we're conceptual, so there's a lot of variables. We don't even know yet if the um, arena is going to go on block B or block, or excuse me, block D or block C. So those things are going to have that influence of what happens. But to your point, the concept would be ideally is that there's a very gradual grade uh, increase from Pacific Avenue uh, that could go all the way up so that by the time you get to the levee, and you don't even know it, you're just kind of walking along and uh, you know there's an apparent grade change, and all of a sudden you're at the levee, no stairs, et cetera. But if that could happen also from Front Street, it might be a little bit higher, but it still could be a grade change. Um, or it could be an integration of a series of steps. You know, it's, it, there's a lot that goes into that. How does the, how does the street meet the, the building base and all sorts of nasty stuff? That, well, okay. This is dream time. <laughs> I'm getting too detailed. I love no, that no, dream, but it's, and I'm worried that if we don't ask for it, like right now, you know, right. It never But the, the concept is there, okay. and, and so it's, the, from a policy standpoint, that's, that's alive. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Dan, good evening. Thank you. Um, I had a question about the Cliff Street extension there. That's not technically within the red border of the plan area. And so I, like Commissioner McKelvey, really appreciate those improvements um, for walkability. Um, so I guess I just wanted to know, um, because it's not technically in this plan area, how are those improvements um, going to... Bill says it's coming in the next slide set. I think but probably all of my questions are going to be related to the next section. I would say to that one of the project goals, though, of connecting this area better to the beach area as well. This is one of those prime uh, pedestrian connections there. And so are these improvements um, anticipated 
outside of this plan because they're not technically in the border of the plan. That's okay. You don't have. If it, we don't know. We don't know. That's fine too. <laughs> for for the purposes of acreage and defining the boundary strictly, um, that's what the red line is. But the connectivity is very much part of the plan. And I'll, I, there's a couple slides uh, next that I'll talk about what's in there and what okay. the policies are related to what both of your vision is, because you're right on. OK, excellent. And then I would also then, um, I do think improvements should also be made that extend down Pacific in the same manner, because the walkability of that section is not, is not good. Um, and the improvements that were made, I can't even remember when those were done, maybe 20 years ago. And, but the plantings that were put in at that time really don't meet the need. And so, you know, if we're looking at this whole area, then it does seem to make sense to add in that part of Pacific as well. Yeah, I agree. And there, there is one or more policies in the plan that talk specifically about um, improving that as a, as a master planning effort because there's there's no street lighting on there, the sidewalks, there's lots of curb breaks. I mean, it's a it's an unfortunate jumbled mess. So I'm Agreed. right with you. Great, I'm, I'm glad we agree on that. Um, then I also would just say that I also uh, think we need parking um, down here. The, I know that the Santa Cruz Symphony is also anticipating making use of that arena and the patrons of the symphony, you know, they're not mostly cyclists and walkers. So um, I'm on the symphony board, so it's, it's not totally that way. But um, I just think that realistically, we have to anticipate and plan for parking. Um, thank you. That's it. Thank you. Let's go to the next session. Hey, I'm going to go through this fairly quickly. So basically, we've talked about the community um, spaces of which there's seven and there's policies associated with that. Now we're just going to come up a level and these basically streetscape and circulation, uh, we're really just talking about design parameters, you know, like improve, provide high quality materials, um, you know, kind of the, the, the nuts and bolts pieces of it. Um, there is related to this an entire um, set of street cross sections and as I said, we're not going to, I'm not going to put all those in tonight. But if you want to go back and look at them, that gets in the detail of what do these streetscapes actually look like and how are they going to function. And they've gone through many iterations and refinements, so they're, they're in pretty good shape there in context. I think the key thing to, there to recognize is that there is, as I noted at the beginning, uh, an effort to push the buildings back. So there's going to have to be some play there on development area versus the, the community space, the public realm. Um, but the idea is big sidewalks, ample bike lanes, um, really creating that, that public realm uh, in a high quality manner. So streetscape and circulation, uh, there's policies in here related to basically, you know, seating and the quality of materials, um, landscaping, um, how, how the entire space works. So I'm not going to get into detail on that. On the pedestrian and bike circulation, I just want to note that of what you're seeing in the conceptual diagram here, all of these streets, with the exception of Center Street, are designed with the cross sections of either uh, a dedicated or, in the case of the levee, a fully separated bike path. So there is a network, and the idea is to connect this area north with the downtown and south into the beach area and letting that network continue. So it's complementary um, to that whole uh, design master planning effort. Um, other components with this, you'll see, for example, the idea on the photo on the right side is where you can do a separated where you've got some sort of landscaping that's pulling the cars away from the bikes. Uh, in some cases, we're doing that with parking. Um, so there's, there's different criteria and policies in there. And then there's policies in there that ref, uh, respond to how to design the intersections and what they should look like, um, sizing and, and radius of curves and all sorts of good stuff in there. Um, that basically focus on really making sure that it's a pedestrian safe space because that's what really enhances that public realm is people feel safe in those environments. It takes it a long way in the quality of, of their experience. So streetscape design, this deals with all of these uh, topics here. Um, streetscape furnishings or you know, benches and um, 
the hardscape components, trash receptacles, et cetera, landscaping, lighting, et cetera. You can see the list there. So there's policies associated with each of these. And beach connectivity, oh, I've got a couple slides and then we'll get to beach connectivity. So within the context of, um, of those street design uh, policies, uh, there's a couple of themes here that I want to note. One is creating engaging community spaces that we've been talking about. So ample places for seating and gathering, um, you know, really making the, the plaza and the side streets, Pacific Avenue or Laurel Street extension, that, that little tucked in cove, um, you know, they're, they're, they're quality spaces that are engaging and, and promote interactivity, uh, both at a small level and then at a community event level. Um, and then the idea of, of interactive illuminated art, I keep being a big proponent of this because I think as, if it is an entertainment area, uh, what a great opportunity to do that. Um, and Santa Cruz already does this. They've got this through the Museum of Art and History. They have a biannual event called Frequency, and it's all about art, light, and, and music. I mean, like, okay, there you go. So it could be an expansion of that, complementary. So I don't think there's, like, anything where we're replacing something. I think the idea is... Santa Cruz is seen with the complementary of all these features that, that all work together and create the, the vibe that makes Santa Cruz what it is. Uh, beach connectivity. So I've, uh, I've, your, your comments are right on. So uh, here's the news. <laughs> so within, I want to make sure I read some of these because I don't want to miss some of them. Bear with me just for a second here. So within the context, there are policies that specifically call out First, improving the um, streets, excuse me, the stairs that go from the Santa Cruz River Walk up to the top of Cliff Street. Um, and so that's going to need a bit of work. It, you know, it's right now it's a little bit narrow and uh, there's not enough lighting, et cetera. So the idea is, is to redesign the Cliff Street stairs um, and basically to encourage that connectivity. It's the most direct way over to, to, the, um, to, the, to the boardwalk. Uh, the other is, and let me use this slide here, it's getting a little covered up, but in the upper right, you can see the view from the top of the stairs. That's a magnificent spot. So the idea for a policy to create a, a, a special look out there that, that, you know, you can look up the river and the mountains behind and the downtown. So that's a real gem there that we want to, um, that capitalizes on uh, with some policy language to improve that. And then lastly is to create a um, streetscape plan for the Cliff Street corridor. So those two center photos is Cliff Street looking out towards the ocean and really just looking at how that can get redesigned. And it probably doesn't take a lot. I mean, there's, uh, there's some existing infrastructure with sidewalks, but the parking changes. Sometimes it's angled, sometimes it's parallel, et cetera. So um, maybe enhancing the intersections to just tighten them down a little bit and some landscaping. But it could be something that's done uh, fairly cost effectively and have a really high reward for that connectivity. So that's envisioned uh, per your questions. So with this, we'll go to clarifying questions. And then just for context, for timing here, after if there's any clarifying questions on this uh, streetscape and circulation, then Matt's going to talk about Chapter 4, and it gets into the design guidelines and whatnot. And then there'll be another opportunity on that. So that's kind of the, the agenda so far. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Commissioner Dan. I think I'm good. Thank you. Commissioner Kennedy. I didn't have any questions on this part. Commissioner McKelvey. Just want to make one observation. Um, the slide that shows the nice kind of uh, plaza with the two streets going off in different directions with buildings, I think it said it was emerging, emerging uh, here? There, engaging. There isn't any space on this plan that is that scale. That's 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 kind of what my comments were about before with the fact that the street kind of cuts through a, a pie of, of buildings. Yeah. And I would just like to see a place of more gravity. That's yeah. Actually that lower right is about the scale yes, and width. I agree. I yeah, agree. That's but so this this picture yeah. on the left. The picture on the left is meant to just convey the context of gathering spaces and using I, lighting and illumination. And I like, get that. Yeah. It's, it's candy. Yeah. <laughs> Needs to be real. Commissioner Thompson. I don't have anything. Council Member Newsom. Council Member Brown.
Council Member Watkins. I just have one question about how the river walk is sort of integrated into this kind of beach connectivity um, vision. I know you focused on some of the other ways, but I didn't see that stand out. That is a very good question. Um, so similar to what you see in the northern part of downtown here, where it's going to be no longer having the space between the building and the back of the levee, similar here, and then separated space for people who are biking and people who are walking, and more space for people to slow down also. So kind of spaces right now, if you're on the river walk and you want to stop and chat or look at the birds or look at the flowers, there's a possibility of bikes going by you. So just more space spread out for people to be moving at different speeds to stop and chat um, and to have that connectivity continue all the way down to you know, the base of the log ride there and where we have the trestle bridge as well. There's some additional projects that we have going on. So we're committed to improving both north and south on the river walk here. Okay, great, thank you. The vice mayor is recognized. Council member Colin Tar Johnson. Thank you. Just a brief comment. The um, interactive illuminated art, I think it's an opportunity for us to connect that to what we're going to be doing with the downtown alleyway activation. Mm -hmm. That's it. Thank you. Council Member Bruner. I just wanted to comment on the illuminated art. And again, I go straight to logistics and and ensuring that somewhere down the line it's dark sky compliant and you know that we're looking at the context working with local artists and what that looks like um, the concept yes I get it it's great um, but I start immediately going to all the details and the logistics of what that means so we could have so many um, concepts around that but at some point, it will need to get a little more focused about what exactly that looks like. I agree, and great comment. I just want to note there are specific policies in there related to night sky and how to yes. do that illumination. So, great. Uh, and the city has a policy already, so it's really enhancing and improving on that. Yes. And because of its relationship with the river, it's very important. I appreciate the circulation. Thank you. Commissioner Gordon. I'm still saving mine. Thanks. Very good. Thank you. Next item. All right. So this is the last section. This is on the downtown plan amendments to the specifically to the downtown plan as it exists right now. So this relates to development and design guidelines. So this plan would create uh, would add this this uh, south of Laurel area to the downtown plan. And so this right here would be uh, the proposed downtown plan area. And so we're, the next couple of slides are gonna show this south of Laurel area in relation to the, the current downtown plan uh, and how it's brought in. Uh, the downtown plan right now has these various districts uh, and the south of Laurel area would be that, that southern district in the blue there. And so one important thing, uh, well, the most important thing here is the floor area ratio. Uh, and that is, that's the, uh, determines how, how much is built or can be built on a specific property. So for instance, if you have a 10,000 square foot lot and you have a 10,000 square foot building, that would be a floor area ratio or FAR of one or if there's a 20,000 square foot building on that 10,000 square foot lot, it'd be an FAR of two. Um, and that's really what guides a lot of development in our, in our current downtown area. Uh, and as you can see in the map on the right there, our existing downtown plan has an FAR of, of 5.0 throughout the plan. And our, our proposal currently uh, for the South of Lower area has those four key blocks, A, B, C, and D, uh, those are proposed to have a FAR of 4.0, and then the other blocks uh, in to the to the west of those, uh, mostly on Paci on the west side of Pacific, and then uh, 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 and then center would have a FAR of, of 3.5. And so, 
What, what we see here, uh, based on these FARs, you can do some calculations on approximately how many units would, would come online based on, we did a number of test fits uh, to figure out, you know, prototypes of like what type of building would fit in these projects and how many units would typically be in them. And so we came to a number that uh, you know, currently without a density bonus, uh, that area would have uh, 950 units as it currently exists right now without this plan. Uh, and then with, with a density bonus, that'd be a, a 1,150. So the goal of this plan was to add some housing capacity to this area. Uh, or so, sorry, the, I, I messed that up. The current, the current has 950 and the, and the density bonus on that would be 1,400. Our, our plan, uh, raising it to 4.0 FAR, that proposal in those areas and then 3.5 for the rest, uh, would increase the housing capacity to approximately 1,150. And, and then a 50% density bonus uh, would get that to approximately 1,750. And so that, that's a really important uh, distinction is, is that there's, that's a big assumption is that every, every development in every parcel of this area will all, they'll all redevelop and they'll all use a 50% density bonus. Uh, and uh, so that's a key thing. You know, I, think, I think given uh, a full build out, it's likely that you would arrive you know, around that 1600 as council is directed. Uh, this is just the maximum maximum potential under this under this scenario and so maximum building heights uh, again you can see the downtown is uh, there there's a variety of building heights in the existing downtown uh, this plan proposes to the draft plan proposes to carry those tallest heights of the downtown plan into those four key blocks and then have uh, lower heights of 50 and 70 feet uh, both along that uh, there, there's a, a historic designated neighborhood to the to the west of, of that area. So we're, our, this plan proposes to step down uh, to that neighborhood, and then the the block south of that would be slightly lower in height as well. And uh, an important feature too is that the areas along uh, uh, Beach Hill also have their own uh, uh, reduced height overlay zone to to help keep some of that height from being right up against the, the hillside and those, those neighbors. Um, and so the development standards and design guidelines, um, so this really builds on the existing downtown standards right now. Uh, the look and feel of the, of the downtown currently walking down Pacific Feels wonderful. Uh, you have wide sidewalks, really nice interface with the buildings. The buildings look really good. Uh, there's so many pieces of the current downtown plan that are working really well. And instead of trying to reinvent the wheel and do something different down here, we really did our best just pull those existing standards and just bring them south into this area. So that was really the goal there. Um, and then again, focus on ground floor and storefronts. Those are the most important things that people see walking around downtown. Uh, when you're walking down Pacific, uh, you're never realizing what each of the building heights are you're, that you're walking by. It's really important that storefront and benches and uh, landscaping, things like that. Um, and then uh, the land uses also would be similar to the current downtown. Uh, just bringing down what would be allowed in our existing downtown into this area, but then also having new standards considering this this uh, new larger arena that would be built in this area too. Uh, other down other design standards would be upper stories, uh, articulated, uh, and architectural details, and then we're still working on exactly what policies would be in place. But we do intend to have policies that you know buildings. Of, of a certain height would would start to step back more and more as they go higher uh, to help to help increase that uh, um, uh, solar uh, as well as just the look and feel of the building itself and reducing that mass and then uh, of course uh, you know community spaces uh, being created through some of these uh, dedications as well along the sidewalk and so just really briefly those standards include the arena like I mentioned. 
you know, we're really, really looking for landmark architecture that minimizes blank walls, orients towards that Spruce Street Plaza, uh, includes outward facing restaurants or retail, and then engages the river walk. So one really important thing, I've mentioned the density bonus here before. Uh, a real key component of this is that when we started this plan, that was under, on, under state legislation where market rate housing uh, could achieve up to a 50% density bonus. That has since in the last year and a half been raised to 100% density bonus. Uh, really significant change from what we were thinking about uh, when we started this plan. And so based on that council direction of keeping, keeping this to 12 stories and 20% below market rate, we can't control what people do with a 100% density bonus. Um, they could potentially build above 12 stories, for instance. So it's really important to figure out a way to incentivize development that's beyond the, that state density bonus. And in, in, doing, in creating an incentive to do so, having developers keep to that 12-story limit. So planning staff have been thinking a lot about how to do this. And this is the really key element on really meeting council's direction on this uh, 12 stories and on the affordable housing as well. So we came up with this idea for uh, affordable housing overlay. And so right now it, it's still, it's still under, uh, you know, we're still figuring out the exact specifics of this. Uh, but the general ideas would be two different options for developers to use and, and they could combine the two of them as well. And that's to essentially uh, uh, receive additional floor area ratio FAR in exchange for providing additional below market units. So for instance, that could be uh, 0 0.1 FAR for every 1% additional below market rate unit they provide on the project. Um, more importantly, the one that the incentive that we see being even uh, more lucrative to the development community is allowing inclusionary to be offsite. Uh, current state density bonus does not allow for that. And, and it's a really important way for developers to uh, build a market rate project and then have, have units offsite built by a, a separate uh, affordable housing developer that can receive you know, additional federal and state funds, things like that. And given, given the, the type of financing that's involved in that, you can really increase that below market percentage a lot more than our current inclusionary requirement, for instance. So we're currently contemplating, you know, if, if a developer were to use this offsite inclusionary, uh, that, that amount would have to be 35%, for instance. And you know, if, if some development were to use this, um, 35% getting that, you know, we're, we're really getting towards that 20% overall number. And so that, that's really the goal here is if, if a developer were to buy this additional FAR or to want to have their units offsite, they would have to agree to both those affordability requirements, but then also agree to this 12 story height limit. And we see that as the a, kind of the key way to get developers going down that potential route versus using the state density bonus where we have a lot less control over in terms of height. And so, like I said, there's ongoing analysis on the method of implementation, you know, whether it's a developer agreement or a codified policy, there's pros and cons to those. And then the offsite incentive as well thinking about how we would, if, if a developer were to uh, be required to do their development offsite for their affordable, what's the timing of that? There are two different projects uh, with two different financing mechanisms. How do we tie them together? And also the location of them, thinking about the proximity of, of those projects and how far away in the project site can they be, the market rate project versus the, the affordable project. Um, and then, you know, I, like for instance, one thing we're thinking about is whether it's going to be just within our, the downtown area 
or some kind of radius, whether it's you know 1,500 or 2,000 feet, or and then also considering you know excluding places like uh, beach flats and lower ocean uh, to avoid putting additional uh, affordable housing in that area alone uh, to to further you know. Uh, to, to spread to spread it out more, given that those are generally lower income areas. And so, uh, next steps. So I mentioned that briefly. We have a uh, public comments uh, through June, July 10th on the draft plan that's on our website, uh, and we're reviewing and incorporating those throughout the summer. The draft EIR will be worked on uh, into the fall with a public review period after that. Uh, and then once the, once those are complete, we're anticipating getting back to uh, planning commission and council uh, in early 2025, and uh, then we will be submitting to coastal commission and and going through that process through 2025. And so again, that public review those are to uh, to our our senior planner Sarah Noisy. Uh, this is really her baby, and I hope I did okay presenting this all. On, uh, on short notice, uh, uh, but she did a great job putting the presentation together here. And uh, feel free to send her any comments you have. Uh, she's compiling them all right now, and uh, uh, we're starting to get them in and look forward to more. And so uh, just briefly, the feedback requested prior to going into this comment section. So um, talking about the increased uh, affordable housing overlay, um, general comfort with that concept, uh, that policy concept, and then the location, whether it should only be for sites uh, A, B, C, and D, or more. We've currently thought of it as only uh, for those four, four blocks, given that those have kind of the highest development potential and, and largest block areas for additional building size. Um, and then as well as uh, the current FARs for the majority of this uh, existing south of Laurel area at 3.5, and we're proposing a 4.0 uh, on those blocks, uh, those those four blocks, which would be a, a, a slight up zoning. So you can see here, and there's a, a few other blocks that are, have a, a different uh, density requirement of 55 units per acre, and and aren't uh, governed by that FAR requirement that would we then propose to change over to this uh, FAR instead. And then the proposed maximum building heights as well. So things to think about as we uh, go into question time. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Van Wall. And we agree with you. Ms. Noisy does great work for us. And on this project, she's been unsurprisingly wonderful. And uh, we miss her this evening. But thank you very much for standing in. What I'm going to do now is start with Council Member Watkins go this way, and then I'm going to start with the Vice Mayor and go this way. Mm -hmm. Council Member Watkins. Uh, yeah, no, thank you. And yeah, thanks for stepping in last minute. You did a great job. Um, I'll give some thought to the specific things that you're wanting our feedback on. I have to think about that a little bit more. I want to just say I appreciate your innovation and creativity around trying to kind of meet what our desire is, which is to not have state law really double essentially what we're hoping to have be you know in alignment with our community and and trying to have smart growth in that way i um i won't go on about how frustrating it's been frankly at the local level to try to manage some of this so i just want to applaud you for thinking outside the box that that said <laughs> i'm not really clear about it and I, I'm just sort of trying to understand what that looks like in terms of the off-site inclusionary and is it going into a fund or are we assuming that they own property elsewhere? Um, I, I just don't understand and I'm, I'm not sure. If I'm okay. um, Mr. Butler. Thank you. I was just uh, giving Matt one comment and then was volunteered to go uh, and provide the response. <laughs> um, I wanted to, to note one thing um, <clears throat> that, you know, one of the things uh, before before directly answering your question, Councilmember Watkins, um, 
There is a um, approach where land dedication is required or allowed for um, state density bonus as well. And um, also um, it, they would still need to meet our inclusionary, which has different criteria for offsite. And so in, in both of those components where we're looking at um, how we might um, uh, incentivize the use of the city density bonus or the south of Laurel area density bonus, whatever we call it, um, over the state density bonus, we really need to make that more attractive. And so um, <clears throat> for this particular, for the, the component you were talking about, the offsite, what that would be is something along the lines of a developer wants to develop parcel A. And they say, um, uh, rather than providing the affordable units in, on parcel A, we want to provide more affordable units on some alternative parcel. And um, we would be looking at a substantial increase in the number of affordable units because there's actually quite a, a big benefit to being able to do that off-site. While at the same time, we need to not be so onerous that the developer chooses to use the state density bonus, right? So there's a balancing act there because when the developer chooses to use our city south of Laurel area density bonus, they're also accepting that they will not go over 12 stories. And so they're getting that increased uh, affordability. Um, and what we have just as a, a uh, initial thought in this uh, concept that we've presented is that if it's 100 units um, in the base project um, that they would be looking at 35 units, so a 35% um, inclusionary if they're looking at off-site. Um, you know, certainly we'd be um, open to feedback from the council on that. Um, it's that is uh, that percentage I would say is less sensitive than on-site inclusionary, for example, because with it being off-site, it's likely that they would be doing 100% affordable project and looking for tax credits. Um, and so, um, that's that's the concept, um, and um, can I ask yeah, one follow-up question? So, the, just sorry, I apologize for the layperson understanding, but the the assumption then would be that they own property or they own land offsite, or they purchase it, or they would purchase land offsite that right. would make it okay. Right. It's <clears throat> so so Pacific Front Laurel. Um, and uh, the 205 units that we have there, they did a similar thing for the inclusionary. They didn't use it for density bonus. You know, they dedicated land, which is now Pacific Station South, and we've got 70 affordable units you know, on, on their way there. It's not dissimilar from that, except um, it would qualify them for the density bonus in addition to um, meeting our inclusionary requirements. Thank you for the clarification. Councilmember Brown. I just have one last comment. Oh, and I'm, I'm sorry. sorry. Excuse no, me. I no, didn't it's mean fine. To, excuse I just me. would say I, the only thing I, I just I fear that with the whole state allowance to not allow for parking to add 1,700 units in that already dense area without parking requirements and not a lot of options and I'm not sure what the public transportation like infrastructure will look like, but. I don't think we want to lose sight of what that means in terms of impacts to surrounding areas and experience, frankly, to um, this draw that we're hoping to create in this in this area also. So anyways, just wanted to, to say that I don't, I don't have an answer to that, but I, I think we should caution moving forward. Thank you. Council Member Brown. Thank you. Okay, I have, let's see, I have a clarifying follow-up question. Um, because I want to make sure I'm clear about um, the in lieu option. My uh, so my understanding is that generally with in lieu, the developer pays based on a formula into our affordable housing trust fund, and then that money is used by the city, often in collaboration with other developers to get those projects completed. So, but it, you're talking about the the developers. Who, who want to be in the south of Laurel area being required to do that themselves? Or you're, you're talking about it as if they would do that themselves. I'm wondering if that's the case, or if this would just be an, another 
an overlay um, that provides additional funding into our affordable housing trust fund. And then developers, I mean, they basically are just paying their way out. Just want to clarify what, what the, how that would work. Thanks for that question, Councilmember Brown. You're right, in some instances, our inclusionary allows for in lieu fee payments. Um, there's also allowances for land dedication. Right. And so what we are contemplating as part of this where they would um, be eligible for the density bonus would be associated with land dedication. Only. Yes. And so that is a, um, I would say, more challenging um, component. I mean, our economic development and housing director, Bonnie Lipscomb, can speak to that better than I can um, with her land acquisition experience. But, you know, that is a challenge, right, is, is not just having the money, but also acquiring the land and particularly on sites that have the development potential that um, can produce a substantial number of affordable housing units. And that's why it worked with the, the Pacific Station South project is because there is that uh, the, the land use allowances in place to, to build a, a large number of units there. So that, that's what we'd be contemplating, the land dedication. Gotcha. Thank you. I just wanted to make sure that, because that's what I thought. And then I was listening and it sounded like maybe there was more. Okay, thank you. Um, I have another question. I'm, And this is really kind of just a, a very high level question, and um, I, I think I know some of the answer, but I want to ask if, um, and if it may be helpful to go back to the FAR chart um, and about capacity related to FAR, um, because I'm not clear that going to a, potentially a 4.0 FAR would just allow for 1,750 units. I mean, it seems to me that there could be more significant increase without any the current capacity being 950 just right on the face of it don't we have capacity for 1700 right there if everybody used a hundred percent density bonus correct if, if everyone used a hundred percent density bonus it, it would be greater we're currently showing that 1400 right now uh, with a 50% density bonus. So you're assuming, is there a reason to assume only a 50% density bonus, um, given what we're getting in <laughs> some of the other proposals, the pre-applications we're seeing, I'm not convinced that more developers aren't going to go as big as they can and, you know, in some cases try to get even beyond <laughs> um, based on the way they do the calculations. So again I'm, I'm I'm skeptical about the need to you know and, and what that this might actually do um, if we increase the far to 4.0 um, we we could see yeah what, what even we're more than 1750 we could see potentially what I mean is there anybody done a back of the envelope calculation about what the actual maximum might be it, it is possible too but uh we are again studying 1800 units in the in the eir so that would be what's covered under that larger CEQA study uh, in terms of the uh, currently in our downtown we you know number of projects using density bonus uh, there's the uh, building standards in general uh, once you start going over seven eight stories you're going into steel construction significantly cost prohibitive going beyond that and very difficult to finance and build. Um, and most of those projects downtown that uh, have this 5.0 FAR, for instance, they're largely using the density bonus uh, to waive certain development standards. They're not actually getting a 50% bump in those standards because most of those projects are hitting that, that natural building, building limit of, you know, building code, building standards. Uh, what projects are typically built at. Uh, so even in the existing downtown right now, projects could go higher than eight stories, but you rarely see them. Most of them are hitting that that requirement of, uh, of what our building code is and the costs that change with going above eight stories. So it is possible that every single project could go to 100% density bonus and actually use that 100% <laughs> density bonus and go beyond that. Uh, but it's also just as likely they would stay around 50% total or even less. And that's still assuming that every single site develops 
in this area. And we've already heard from certain property owners that they have no intention of doing anything uh, for the for their life. So we, we know already that some of these sites won't develop, most likely. Thanks. Okay, I just wanted to be, clarify that for those of us who are thinking about making this decision, um, this paints a picture that I think moderates <laughs> the potential, and I think we need to take that into consideration. Thank you, Council Member. Council Member Newsom. Thank you, Mayor Keeley. I have uh, just a quick clarifying question, just trying to make sure I completely understand the concept that was uh, uh, presented to us. So the, the stated policy of the council is for no, for the buildings in the area to be no higher than 12 stories and for 20% of the units to be affordable uh, units. And the concept that was presented is to present developers with incentives that are sweeter or more attractive than the state density bonus law. And <clears throat> in return for developers taking those incentives, they agree to adhere to our policy goals of buildings being no higher than 12 stories and 20% of all units built being affordable housing. Do I have that correct? Is that correct? Yeah, or, or even a greater percentage uh, if they were to choose this offsite option. Right, um, or a greater it would, it would be greater than our housing. inclusionary mm -hmm. requirement, yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Fred. Just wanted to make sure I had that correct. Thank you. Council member, excuse me, Commissioner Thompson. <laughs> um, uh, <laughs> I actually, I, I think that they've done a, a, the staff's done a good job of explaining the math as well as we can, given how many variables there are and how the calculations can be made um, and how, how kind of loose and goosey the state has been with um, uh, making changes. So um, I think that um, this is the right place to, um, to land in terms of what we're trying to accomplish these days. Um, it's, it's sobering uh, to see, though, how complicated it has become. And um, so uh, I, th I think this is the right approach. Um, I think we'll um, still have to think long and hard about the project uh, proposals as they come forward. Um, so uh, I think we're trying to do the right thing and use the right tools. I don't have anything more to suggest tonight, that's for sure. Thank you, sir. Commissioner McKelvey. Thank you, Mayor Keeley. Just two things. One, um, the, the, I think it might be helpful the next time, or in this next round of kind of analysis, if we could have maybe some examples or a direct comparison between the mechanisms that already exist in our inclusionary requirement and how this might differ. I know that it's all, you know, kind of for just grist for the mill right now, but there are a number of different ways of satisfying the inclusionary requirement already, and it would be good to know how we balance that, uh, the incentives, and, and kind of get the most out of it in terms of what we're about or yep. objectives. Yeah, thank you for that comment. Definitely agree. That's something, those specifics we're still working on. Uh, we're also thinking about um, should a developer, you know, do this offsite project and go beyond and be required to go beyond our inclusionary, uh, what is that, uh, you know, what's the affordability percentage? Is it the same as our inclusionary or uh, do we want to, you know, going on with that incentive, make it a higher than, uh, the current inclusionary uh, in terms of the affordability, thinking about moderate, missing middle, uh, or you know, workforce housing uh, uh, levels of affordability as well, and building those into that requirement too uh, might also make it uh, make it more feasible, uh, but still be below market rate versus our current inclusionary, which is lower income. Skip so, yeah, thinking about the, that balance uh, in, in getting that right, something we're definitely still going to be working on quite a bit. Thank you, sir. Commissioner Kennedy. So, without stating I'm in favor of it, like, what would happen if we did just require a park for an arena or a mix 
mixed use project. They ha I'm just working out all this this whole new game we have, but they have unlimited exemptions for cost, right? The shortest answer is that we can't. If you feel like it costs money, then they can just nuke it. But then at least we're sticking up for every neighbor I've talked to in the last two months who says this is too much. You know, it would be like a shallow gesture, but uh, could we do that? No. <laughs> <laughs> Except, uh, yeah, I no. Know, I know. I just wanted to explore it because I feel the people on the playground coming to me and saying, where are people going to park? I should point out, we heard this with the last word. I'll give you one caveat. We can require it for employees of the arena. That is the narrow, narrow, narrow cutoff okay. where we can. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, so my second and last question, kind of comment is, um, can we require measured section drawings? I mean, I know there's a lot we're not seeing here. To me, like, because I've had architectural training, it really helps to put things in perspective of, like, is a 16-story building really that tall? It drives me nuts. The developers put the little people in the building, and then the neighbor's lot, there's, like, no little people because it would show how tall that thing is. So could we require any project in this zone, you know, do a section that way and a section that way, like, from the river to the playground? And what do you think about that? Great call. We have those. Oh, Happy sweet. to go through them in more detail. We've been getting down to inches in the transportation cross sections um, and how that relates, the streetscape relates to the buildings. So And the residential neighborhoods. And the residential neighborhoods, yeah. Cool. Commissioner Dan. Thank you. I just have a couple things. And I mean, I guess I'd start just to say that um, I think that this conversation about housing really underscores how difficult it is to craft a future planning document when we have a state that keeps pulling the rug out from under us. And so, I mean, we're here discussing, you know, uh, this uh, housing for this area, and we don't really know what the next legislation that's coming down the pike, which may completely upend what it is we're trying to do here. So um, you all have a very tough job because you're the final decision makers on that. Um, so I did also have one clarifying question about the um, off-site um, uh, housing option. And so is it contemplated that if that's offered that a developer takes up that, um, that option that the land dedication would be in, could be in, you know, A, B, C, or D, that they, they own a parcel and kind of like the Anton building, they dedicate a portion of that parcel for an affordable unit, and then thus there would be two separate uh, uh, market rate housing unit and then a, an affordable ho housing unit building? That, that would certainly be, thanks for the question, by the way, that, that would certainly be one way to do that. Um, a, another way, uh, a potentially more likely way might be across the street or a few blocks away. Uh, whatever parcel that that can be that can be purchased by that developer, and so we're contemplating, you know, what is that proximity? Is it within the downtown plan? Some kind of radius, uh, things like that. Right. I saw that discussed, and so that kind of leads to the second question. And what is the argument for um, for a, like a distance requirement. So, and you know, I agree that it's probably not appropriate in the beach flats area. There might be other places in the city that are in the same situation as beach flats and south of Laurel. So, I guess I would just say we pro probably some deep thinking needs to go into um, whether or not you know we're going to require where that has to be and how difficult it might be. So, if somebody you know, a de developer is building a 12-story. Um, project that could have 500 units in it, 35%, that's 175 affordable units would be fantastic, but that's not no easy task to find a, you know, piece of land that's affordable and would work for that. So I don't know, I would caution against limiting um, options, options there. Yeah, thank you for that comment. Um, yeah, I think the, the thinking there initially was, uh, both given the downtown has, you know, it's very amenity rich. Uh, there's generally less parking with affordable housing projects um, and being even closer to transit. And then also, you know, keeping some spirit of the inclusionary element and 
keeping that mix of incomes in, in, you know, within a certain area uh, versus just the building itself. But that's a good point too. I mean, we need a need affordable housing, more affordable housing everywhere. Yeah, and I don't know that there is a, a right answer. I'm not advocating mm -hmm. any. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. The Vice Mayor is recognized. My question was um, about when I was looking at one of the maps a few maps back and with the height for the different areas of downtown. And there was one slide that showed right there, yeah. So, this, so I think we all, the elephant in the room, that 18 story clock tower building that's there, they had the planning meeting and the pre design stuff submitted. Um, I think that's over 50 feet. So, how, how can, how, how, you know, if now if we're going to eight to 85 here, I'm almost asking, this sounds rhetorical, but why are we even doing this? Can't they just build whatever they want? Yeah, th thank you for that question. I hate to be so blunt, but people are asking me that. So, you don't hate yeah, that you're right. I don't hate it. I love being blunt. <laughs> yeah, thank you. It, I, 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 I agree. You know that that is, that is difficult, but what we uh, we certainly can't assume that every project is going to use the density bonus to the maximum extent, and and they certainly it, it's likely they won't, um, and so. In, in bringing these heights down, really, we we're looking at what base projects could be. Um, it's important to think about, too, if, if we get some of these development scenarios right, you know, it also disincentivizes the use of density bonus to get around those standards as well. Uh, so 85 feet right now, for, for instance, in those four blocks that we show, that's, that's kind of that natural cutoff of those building heights in general, which is how that numbers come about that's actually a, a a building code at 85 feet the second you go above that there's different fire standards there's different building standards and the costs increase substantially uh, so 85 feet's a this natural cutoff where if we see just a base project not using density bonus that's actually a really feasible height for a typical project uh, so the goal would be to get in those within those bounds to not need a density bonus uh, but it's not to say that you know, someone couldn't, and we, we do see it often, uh, typically not above 85 feet. And I just have one final thought, and that is basically piggybacking on what Commissioner Dan said, in that um, with the changing regulatory landscape at the state level, I know um, many of us in the room and in the community would like to see the permanent arena built within our lifetime and not have this sit on a shelf somewhere. Um, and I think it would behoove us to help get these, this area re redeveloped in um, a timely manner before the rules just keep changing. And then we end up with, excuse me, skyscrapers when that's not what we want. And trying to work with the current owners and the people that are, you know, doing, willing to do this work within this lifetime so that um, we can actually see this plan come to fruition. So I appreciate all of the work. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Councilmember Kalantari Johnson is recognized. Thank you. Um, to a point that I believe Commissioner Dan made earlier around the financing of public amenities, um, it was lightly touched on in the report in this section that we could consider conditions of approval that would contribute to the financing of public spaces. What would it look like for us to have a policy direction that across the board we would have a development fee that would go into the pot of money, or a pot of money for public amenities. Could we do that? Could we consider that policy direction? What would that look like? Is it legal? Would it stop all development? Could we do it? Thanks for that question, Councilmember Calantari Johnson. Um, so many things that we uh, get questions for are answered with Maybe. Um, <laughs> so um, yes, there's the possibility that we could do that with respect to um, uh, an impact fee. Um, the council is likely aware of the recent Supreme Court case in Sheets versus El Dorado County that um, 
puts even stricter regulations on cities as they relate to the nexus studies associated with impact fees. And so we would need to analyze how that um, could potentially be done with um, identified public improvements that the city would be wanting to make as it relates to arts or other types of um, enhanced public facilities, and then um, attribute um, the percentage of those improvements um, to the new developments and not to the city as a whole. And so um, some funding could be generated in that respect, but um, there's certainly a um, significant um, uh, nexus study hurdle that we would need to get over, and um, that analysis would we would have to do um, in depth. Okay. So at the appropriate time and space, I would like to provide that direction. I don't know if it's today or a different time. I know today's consensus space. So this is a good opportunity to, to understand how we will provide direction. Uh, rather than doing it by motion, what we'll do is do it by consensus. So the gentle lady may have something. I absolutely have something we'll be discussing later. So we'll see. We'll do it rather than by motion. We'll do it by consensus. Maybe after right? public comment. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. So what other piece... Um, the so exciting that we will have new retail space uh, come into this area, and uh, I know there's a lot of intention and policy direction and work that's gone into our existing downtown and filling in the retail space. So I guess it's question comment: How are we thinking about filling in the retail space? Hopefully, in our lifetime, and um, will it be an extension of the strategies that we are have in place and are we thinking of putting in place for our current downtown? I see Ms. Lipscomb nodding, so. <laughs> yes, Council Member Kalantari Johnson, thank you for that question. Yeah, we are looking at a variety of policies and incentives right now in our existing downtown, both looking at more flexible, um, the opportunity to have pop up in some of our, uh, our existing um, downtown locations and retail spaces. I think the key word is flexibility and the need to be flexible and to adapt as times change. And we are in a period of sort of retail uncertainty. There's a lot of volatility and we need to be flexible. I think also one of the visions for this area is it's looking at sort of that expanded sort of entertainment district with some art elements to it as being flexible within that sort of perspective and vision for the area as well as far as some of those ground floor uses. And as far as just one other thing that we were talking about as to that flexibility is allowing periods of time up to a year, et cetera, where you can be a little more flexible in what some of the, the ground floor spaces are and allowing for um, activation in creative ways. Thank you. Mr. Butler. Thank you. Sure. I'd, I'd like to add one thing to the prior um, comments, which was um, focus, those were focused on the impact fees and a nexus study associated with those. but. Um, Director Lipscomb spoke about the Enhanced Infrastructure Financing District and Community Facilities District. And so there are alternative mechanisms by which we could um, achieve the, the same uh, objective. And um, mm. if the council's contemplating direction by consensus, uh, of course, um, then um, uh, having that more broadly, um, uh, that, that broad goal, would be better so that we could explore multiple avenues to potentially achieve that. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member. Council Member Bruner. Thank you, Mayor. Um, thank you for speaking about the financing. I know that was also some of the input we've received um, in, in some of the emails um, as well, some of the questions um, around who will pay the fees on um, any of the non-grant funded costs and um, how how that will all work. I think, um, you know, this is looking again at kind of this conceptual plan for this area and, and there are still a lot of um, unknown, but a lot of good questions. And um, 
Um, I have some questions around the commercial spaces, so I'm glad you spoke to some of that. And um, I, I think from um, what I um, have heard over time and what I've seen is that it's it will be super beneficial to have flexibility in commercial space. And there was even one um, uh, member of the public who wrote in some comment um, asking about will there be affordable commercial space, not just affordable housing, but affordable commercial space. And as we look to the future of retail, we all know how much that has changed in the last 10, 20, 30 years, especially with online shopping. I know Santa Cruz is great in, in making the effort to support local. Um, so we've moved away from large department stores and these huge 10-year leases um, that sit empty. There are still empty vacancies on these large spaces in the current downtown district. So um, thinking about what those commercial spaces are, I really um, would like to just um, speak for the people who I've heard from and from myself that having them be smaller, flexible, live work, different uses, experiential retail, um, you know, keeping it broad and not limiting it so that it can truly be community serving and um, thinking also about um, community needs in terms of childcare, grocery stores, those basic necessities with all these residential components coming in right all around that area, making sure there's no food desert, for example, and not just restaurants to eat out at, especially for low-income people who can't afford to eat out at restaurants all the time. So really, those commercial spaces are huge, and that arts and culture serving need um, of having live work, even if it's a separated I don't know if that's an official term that means one thing, but having um, you know a, a resident apartment uh, unit and you know across the street there's little studios. Like having flexibility is going to be key moving forward. I really um, hope that we can keep that in mind um, with as this plan moves forward and evolves and all those little unknowns start falling into place and um, how we how we make that into our policy for this area. Did you want to comment on that? Yeah. Thank, thank you, Council Member Bruner. Those, those were great comments and we'll, we'll definitely take them to heart going forward. I did want to point out in the plan, I mentioned how important it was to bring all these great standards in our current downtown plan south into this area, one standard that we actually did propose changing was uh, decreasing uh, retail and commercial size requirements in mixed use buildings for that very reason to yeah. allow for more flexibility and cheaper spaces. Yes, the smaller little micro, like shared, shared vendor spaces, markets, you know, Abbott Square Market is, a, is an example of that, and they're all over the Bay Area. Um, you know, there are many different types of commercial spaces, so, and what's current in our city is very limiting. And, um, you know, there's so many wonderful, like, traveling the world, you can see so many creative ways of um, how commercial uh, spaces serve the needs of the community in, in really enriching ways. And our, so, yeah. Thank you. Um, the other um, thing I wanted to say is, oh, did you want to add to that? Yeah, if I could. I just yes. wanted to add one thing about our downtown kiosks and our downtown pops program that I should have mentioned earlier, but or 
sort of resonate with what you were just talking about. And so our kiosk program is a city subsidized program. Those are city owned sites, as you as you know, and are familiar with them. And so one of the ideas too in this area is that we could have other opportunities for sort of newly visioned sort of kiosks or even the little micro you know, retail or little restaurant pop-ups that give an opportunity for entrepreneurial businesses, for new ideas, new concepts, and less risky. Yes. And that's the same concept with our downtown POPs program, and that is a city-subsidized program. And of course, as you all know, it started during the pandemic as a, as a response to, you know, vacant spaces and, and being able to activate. A similar concept in the, in the south of Laurel area would be to take advantage of, and a recommendation to the council to consider, is expanding our downtown POPs program to this area so that we can consider that as well. It's both less risky for new businesses, entrepreneurial ideas, but also for owners of those spaces to try a new concept. So that's something we would recommend as a policy in this area as well. Thank you. Yeah, those low-income commercial spaces, incubator spaces, startup spaces, it takes a lot to, to do a, a brick-and-mortar business. And if we don't allow for that and people primarily shop online, we don't get the sales tax. And, and we don't get the benefit of supporting a lot of these are family, local people that, um, you know, could be someone sharing their art or their makings or, you know, it, and there's so many endless possibilities. So thank you. Keeping that in mind, yes. Um, this is just a quick comment on uh, the Sola Plaza. I, <laughs> um, that I think it stands for South of Laurel, and you also had mentioned Spruce Street Plaza. So is that the same thing? Just two different terms? I just wanted to clarify on that. Yes, it's the same thing with two different terms. It's kind of evolved. Okay. I think the preferred uh, is Spruce Street Plaza, so we could make that more consistent. Okay, thank you for clarifying that, I thought. Um, and then there was a question about the 85 feet, 75 feet, and my understanding is on, like, how many stories that is. Like, when we talk about feet and stories... 85 feet sounds like a lot, and that's about, what, eight stories? What is that? There's a um, formula that you can average how many stories is 85 feet? Typ typically, it would be about seven stories. Seven. Uh, the, the calculation would be usually there's a 15 to 20 foot ground floor for the retail commercial component and then about 10 feet per story after that. Sometimes they're a, a just slightly higher or lower than that, uh, give or take, but that's that's the typical calculation. And 85 feet, you can get uh, eight stories in if you do like a mezzanine on the first floor or top floor, for instance, uh, and that's how you can get to an eight-story project in 85 feet, for instance, uh, you know, 15 plus, plus seven, 10 above it. That's helpful. I think um, going forward, too, it would be helpful also to maybe have the feet and slash stories just for a better concept and understanding. Yeah, we've, we've certainly gone back and forth on that. Uh, I'll, I'll, we'll definitely figure out a way to maybe make that more clear. Uh, but, uh, yeah, given, you know, depending on how tall someone makes the ground floor, Changes right. how many but stories average, there are. And like, right? 85 yeah. feet is, you know, 16 story clock tower application that was submitted, or, you know, is it the El Palomar building that is downtown, right? Mm -hmm. And so just having that some kind of context. Yeah, 85 feet would typically be like the, the Pacific Front Laurel project that, that's going in right yeah. now. Okay. Um, Okay, and um, I think that, that that's it for my questions. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member. Commissioner Gordon. I think I'm going to skip. I'm assuming we are going to still have discussion because this is clarifying question time, and I think the public is here to 
share. So, thank you, Commissioner. We are now going to go out to public comment. There are going to be a couple of ways we are going to work on this. First of all, uh, one person has requested additional time, and I'm going to acknowledge that person first. And then what we will do is we'll take just line up, and we'll take pe people in the order in which you line up. In the event that there are folks who want to comment online, we'll take one person in line, then one person online, then one person in line, then one person online. This is how we do all council meetings uh, for those of you who have not participated in this way of doing things. So let me acknowledge Mr. Hall if he is still here. We will take his testimony. <coughs> Mr. Hall, good evening. Welcome. Well, thank you very much, Mayor Keeley, and um, thanks to all of you, really, for a very enlightening uh, session so far about a crucial topic. I want to start out by giving you all a gift from our town, our downtown, our future, uh, which I think really cuts the heart of some of the details of things you're going to have ahead, uh, ahead of you, and it's Jan Gell's book, uh, Cities for People. And I have one volume for the city council and the mayor, and another volume uh, for uh, the uh, Planning and Community Development Department. Mr. Hall, if you'd be kind enough to give that to the clerk, she'll accept that on our behalf, and thank you very much for that. So, and I think uh, Jan Gels, he's a um, professor of urban planning and an architect in uh, Copenhagen, and uh, has some really good ideas. Uh, so it's worth looking at for the kinds of details that face you going forward. Uh, I think there's also a kind of a holistic problem here that has to be addressed. You have a lot of really interesting components, a lot of interesting ideas. I, I really appreciate uh, some of the suggestions and comments that people have made about flexibility in business spaces and some of the problems that have been raised. The gestalt of it for me is a concern that the overall project may just be too big for the downtown infrastructure to bear. Uh, and several of you have mentioned parking problems, the issue of where are people going to park. I don't want to see a lot of people driving downtown to park, but I did tonight, and I'll bet many of you did as well. Uh, and also, uh, importantly, the traffic volume. Uh, I haven't seen anywhere in that report, maybe I missed it, it's a big set of documents, a report on an analysis of the volume of traffic and how that will be accommodated when you have that significant an increase in housing units and uh, uh, an entertainment district and perhaps an arena. Uh, if you step back from it, an imaginary exercise to do, I doubt that you'll follow this line, but one thing to think about would be, well, what if you solve that problem by locating the arena someplace else. Uh, and I'm thinking, if I were coming to Santa Cruz and I had a, a blank slate in which to um, uh, decide where to put things, I would put that arena at River Street and Highway 1 and the shopping center that's there that uh, has uh, lots of parking, lots more space, lots more highway access and so forth, and it would be in sort of northern anchor of the downtown and leave this area of downtown for the very interesting possibilities of the arts district, uh, the entertainment district, and so forth that could be there. If you don't do something like that, I fear that you're going to create an immense problem that probably won't be faced for another 10 years or so, but in 10 or 15 years, uh, people are going to be um, using unfortunate language to um, describe the situation that they, they could be facing. Uh, the other thing that I think is important, and I'll just close with this, is the scale of the project relative to human social life in cities. And this, again, is something that Jan Gels speaks to. After you get buildings of a certain height, beyond a certain height, the people who are living in the buildings, he argues, lose contact with the street they see the street as just a way of getting from one place to another. Now, we can debate that point. We can talk about that point. But it is worth considering height. Can we achieve the purposes of the city within a height limit of, say, 10 stories after the density bonuses are in there? 
Uh, and it's, I, I got to say that the presentations were excellent, except that the, the array of data about how high things would actually end to be, you, you feel like you're playing a little bit of pinball. Uh, but I want to suggest keeping the height limit down uh, would be an achievement that would increase the uh, viability of it as a community space. Thanks very much for your attention. Thank you, Mr. Hall. We have someone online, Ms. Bush. We'll take that person, then we'll take the gentleman here. Person online, good evening. Welcome. Yes, uh, thank you for your time. Thank you. Um, I uh, am very excited about this plan because we're including space for people, for pedestrians who are mingling that is not going to be dominated by automobiles. I very much encourage you to consider more of this because when you design a city for people, then you get it filled with people. When you design a city for automobiles with lots of parking, you get lots of automobiles and no room for the people. And the people don't feel safe because the automobiles are large, heavy, fast, and make it difficult for people to get around. So I would encourage you to not think so much about parking, not think so much about subsidizing more automobile space and think more about this space for people. The, one of the first questions was about how are we gonna pay for this infrastructure for people? But then all these people come along and say, oh, but we need more parking. Well, you're gonna have to pay for that infrastructure too. You know, that's a lot more expensive, especially the council member who suggested underground parking. That's just completely ridiculous in my opinion. All right, thank you for listening. Thank you. Good evening, sir. Good evening. Uh, my name's Joe Quig. I'm a, I'm a developer. I also live in this area on Pacific Avenue. We own a little hotel. And when I first heard about this and saw my hotel torn down and replaced by a stadium, I was quite surprised. But now that I've seen all the work that's gone into it, I kind of, you know, being a developer at heart, feel like I don't want to stop this from happening. And one of the things I strongly suggest, and I think it would work, is if all of the owners got together, if you were able to get the owners of all these properties together, it seems to me that they'd be more open to doing this if it was done in a fashion where they were they figured out what they were going to do with their, with the sale of their properties, or how they were going to move, or where they were going to move, and they could actually incorporate moving into the production of the, of the neighborhood, and um, and it would work. It could happen all at the same time, and you could actually get it done in our lifetimes, which is really what you want to do. Um, right now, I am not in any mood to sell my property. I know of two other owners that are not in the mood to sell, but I would be convinced if we could do something like that. And I'd hate to be the one to stop this from happening. I think it is a good thing for the city. Um, and you, somebody mentioned a development team. Is that a development team that the city has put together? Is that a private development team? that's been contacting me, trying to find out what's going on in that area. Um, I think the, uh, the owners should be the ones making the money on this when they sell, not the developers who are gonna come in, put the deal together, and then sell it to a, another company, make more money. It's my bell, so. Um, other things to say, but I'll be around. So. Mr. Quick, thank you very much. Person online, Ms. Bush. 
We'll take that next person online. Good evening, welcome. Person online, good evening. We'll take the next Sorry, person online here. Second there. I'm, I'm in now. Nope, not, nope, we're gonna wait. You're gonna wait. No problem. Good evening. Hello, good evening. My name is Brian Shields. I'm a uh, field rep with Carpenters Local 505. And I uh, just wanted to take a moment. Um, beautiful, a lot of work. I could see that, uh, you know, mayor, council, and, uh, and commission. I uh, appreciate the moment to get to speak here. I just wanted to take a moment to also highlight the fact that labor would need to build this, right? And you have a massive opportunity here to invest in the local workforce uh, through some just key things like apprenticeship and healthcare, um, whatever, at whatever level it is, right? But uh, having that apprenticeship will continue to build builders in this community um, and, uh, and provide, you know, blue collar, middle class opportunity to folks such as myself. Uh, before I got in the union, I was uh, non-union. I made $15 an hour and I built, built I'm sorry, built multi-million dollar mansions and uh, uh, no health care, yada, 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 so on and so forth. So at this point in time, you know, I get to be a married man. I do own a little piece of land in Santa Cruz County and uh, I'm proud and uh, also a father and my, my daughter has health care. Um, you know, we're able to survive here and live here and invest here and spend our money here and all of those things. So I wanna be able to provide this opportunity and I, and I know I'm looking at a lot of nodding heads here as well. Uh, to the next generation, to the folks that are going to get to build this thing, um, because it'll be a huge, huge, huge uh, investment in the community uh, and, and, of course, the workforce. So uh, thank you so much. I appreciate the time. Thank you, sir. Next person online, good evening. Welcome. Good Hi, evening. Uh, council members, this is Rick Longinati from the Campaign for Sustainable Transportation. Um, I want to address uh, parking and transportation in, in South of Laurel because I think that um, the city has an opportunity to actually re reduce the amount of uh, automobile ownership through providing incentives. And the incentive would be to unbundle, to require the developers unbundle the cost of parking from the cost of renting or owning a unit. In other words, you go to rent a, an apartment and you pay separately for the parking space or if you don't own a car, you opt out of paying for that parking. Um, we have a downtown currently where uh, in most downtown census tracts, between 15% and 33% of households don't even own a vehicle. 55% um, of renter households own one vehicle or less. Um, so this idea of unbundling, it allows tenants to opt out and that reduces their cost of housing it also reduces vehicle ownership, and I can send you studies uh, of in San Francisco where unbundling is required, where the amount of vehicle ownership is significantly reduced because of this unbundling. So it both is a both strategy for affordability in both market rate and 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 uh, below market units, but it's also a strategy to reduce vehicle ownership, keeping uh, uh, the traffic to a minimum. There are other things that can be done, which is uh, already being done. Uh, the Pacific Shores apartment on the very west side of Santa Cruz, where the developer was required to provide bus passes for all the tenants, that could be done. Uh, developers could provide uh, a low cost subscription to the B-cycle, electric uh, bicycles. There are a lot of ways to reduce the amount of cars on our road. And I encourage you to build that in. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lanchinati. Mr. Schiffer, good evening. You for all of your work in the community after for so many decades. Thank you very much for that. Thank you, um, and good evening, good evening, members of the council and the planning commission. My name is Andy Schifrin, and I'm speaking this evening uh, with my personal views as a Santa Cruz resident. The city council adopted major revisions to the city's general plan um, and the downtown plan during the 20 teens. The revisions were were approved after a robust community planning process and responded to concerns about the high housing prices at the time. The revised general plan and downtown plan allowed for significant housing density increases along the major transportation corridors and in the downtown. While not universally applauded, the increased 
and general plan densities represented what the city council decided was a reasonable vision for future development in the future, in the city. The expectation at the time by community members and the city council was that the maximum densities in the general plan would be the maximum densities that could be permitted. That was the reality of the time. That's not the reality anymore. The, re the legislature and the governor have fundamentally changed uh, our reality. The law giving developers the right to double density bonuses means that whatever the approved general plan density is, it can now be doubled at the request of a developer, and it's their right. Um, so if the maximum density along SoCal Dr uh, uh, Avenue is 60 units per acre, it can, it's now by right 120 units an acre. If the development allowed in the downtown is in a flurry ratio of five, it's now 10 at the developer's option. As the council is seeing, is aware of what's happening with the 16-story building. That building is now proposed at about 560, about 550, 60 units an acre. So I urge you. Hold on just a second. Um, we have three minutes on these, and I think we were setting the clock at two. So take an extra minute, Mr. Schifrin. That was my error. Thank you very much. Um, OK. Um, the staff, I'm urging, what I wanted to just do is urge the council to keep this reality in mind as you consider increased, the staff recommended increased densities in the south of Laurel area. because. Uh, under the, with increased densities, there is going to be the ability, uh, maybe every developer won't use it, but every developer will be able to use that increased density for more development. And I want to go back to that chart that was on the line, because I think you can get a sense of what's allowed. 950 units without a density bonus, 1,400 units with a 50% density bonus, 1900s with another 50% density bonus. So under the current density, you could get the 1600 units you want without changing the density at all. Under the proposed, it goes from 1150, 1750 to 2300. So it's, I think it's important to face the new reality and recognize that there's no need to change your general plan densities. That's your right. You can't lower them, but you can but you can defy, decide not to raise them. Thank you very much. I'm sorry I took extra time. It's quite all right. Thank you, sir. Is there a person online, Ms. Bush? We'll take that person, then we'll be right with you, sir. Hi, thank you. Uh, this is Kyle Kelly, uh, current transportation commissioner and school board member, speaking in a personal capacity. Um, so I, I, I want to comment on if we if we look to our objective standards. We, we actually are going to get funding from developers depending on how much is actually built. So we, we codified that both in, in square footage requirements or what we get back for transportation funding or what we can do for infrastructure. So putting aside kind of what people feel about parking, there's a lot of needs that are within the city that are addressed with getting additional infrastructure that we're certainly not going to get under Prop 13 protected properties throughout the city. So getting property tax turnover, uh, additional fees. And might I add, now that I understand the school's budgets, we're a basic aid district. So our elementary schools are greatly impacted by getting new turnover in property uh, and, and to get additional funds coming into the schools. So aside from every other reason, and I come and speak and often about about housing in general and the, and the deep need that we have for housing in our city, there's also immense opportunity to, to get revenue back for the city here. So thank you. Well, thank you very much. Good evening, sir. Good evening. My name is Brett Garrett, and I have some brief comments about transportation, lighting, and uh, flooding. <laughs> um, one thing about transportation, I believe Santa Cruz has a Vision Zero policy. So I suggest these documents should explicitly call for compliance with the safety principles of Vision Zero. Um, the project also has an explicit goal of improving connectivity between downtown and the beach. Um, so I want to suggest a better way to do that. Personal Rapid Transit, or PRT, 
It's an alternative form of transit that transcends the usual compromises that often come up when designing a transportation system. Personal rapid transit involves small automated electric vehicles traveling on a dedicated network of guideways, um, probably overhead, completely separate from the roadways and sidewalks, and therefore very compliant with the Vision Zero policy, very safe. A PRT system could connect downtown to the beach with additional boarding zones at all the large developments, kind of like providing an elevator where you can go from one place to another without stopping at all the floors in between. That's so it's better than an elevator. <laughs> um, I believe the large developers will be very willing to include a PRT boarding zone and subsidize this PRT system because it would dramatically reduce the need to accommodate automobile traffic. It would reduce the need for them to build parking. Parking spaces are expensive, and everyone wants to avoid automobile uh, congestion. And now is the time to plan for a PRT system that is fully integrated into any new construction. Um, a quick comment on lighting um, for the sake of the birds and other nocturnal creatures and the environment. Please minimize upward lighting and other light pollution. I was kind of horrified by the image in the appendix draft of the new stadium with an enormous billboard powered by LED lights. Um, please don't do that. That's just my, my gut reaction to that. Um, flooding, I want to mention the entire project is in a flood plain. There's always a strong risk of flooding. Levees do fail from time to time. Flood insurance costs are going up like crazy. Every new building here should be designed to survive a flood, kind of like the building at the, the housing at the tannery. Um, I'm reading this book that has extensive details about the failures of dams and levees called Seek Higher Ground. It's a powerful warning that new development should actually be located outside of floodplains. I'm really worried about flooding for the proposed library and also for these new South of Laurel projects. So back to my original topic, what kind of transportation could work during a flood? An elevated PRT system, of course. So yeah, so I'm, I'm, I'm somewhat skeptical of this project, but if we're going to build it, please include an elevated PRT system that could be subsidized by developers. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. We have a person online. We'll take the next person online. Good evening. Welcome. Uh, hi, this is Frank Barron. Can you hear me? Hello. Good evening. Uh, yes, um, I uh, agree with Andy Schifrin. I, um, he said it much better than I could. But basically, um, the Clock Tower Center project showed us that uh, the developers can go far higher than what the uh, the zoning height limits are. And so keep that in mind. I would say don't raise the height limits. Um, the warriors can get their full eight stories that they said that they could do their entire project for eight with eight stories instead of 12 new arena, um, 1600, you know, housing units, 20% affordable eight stories max that can be done under current zoning. You don't need to go, um, uh, to, you know, you don't need 12 story buildings. You don't need, um, to up zone the areas that are, you know, being proposed to be up zoned with the downtown plan. I like everything, you know, almost everything else about the downtown plan. Um, a lot of the, you know, the public space stuff, the amenities is great. Um, the arena, keeping the warriors here, that's great. Um, I do have a flooding concern, however, um, and that is you should never add fill dirt into a floodplain. That's, you know, uh, hydrology, you know, floodplain planning 101. Uh, it displaces floodwaters. It makes, you know, when the flood does come, it's going to push the floodwaters out further and make them higher. So adding that wedge of material uh, to, you know, make the, the top of the levee flush with the ground level, I think, is a, bit, a big mistake. That's all I got. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Good evening. Good evening, Mayor Keeley, Council Members, Commissioners, Gillian Greenside. I understand that the suggestion to increase the FAR is intended as an incentive uh, for developers not to take advantage of the density bonus. I think there, that needs a lot more thought. I would urge you not to increase the FAR. I say that because the recent um, 
Zoom meeting on the 16-storey clock tower project, I had a hard time understanding how in an area that is zoned 35 feet, you could allow something, for 16, well, I know it's not gone through as a project, but you could even suggest a building of 16 storeys. So I asked questions online, and after three questions, I got my answer. And then I followed up with a planner, and the answer is, there is no height limit. The developers can go whatever height they want. And I was disappointed that that wasn't brought forward by staff at this meeting. And the, so I said, well, if, it's, if they can go whatever height they want, what is it based on? And it's based on the number of units. Well, I said, what is that based on? Is zoning or what? And it was peeling back the layers. And it basically is whatever they propose, but it's related to the FAR. So if you increase the FAR, and that is in place, there's nothing stopping a developer saying, well, that's nice, but I'm going to take advantage of the density bonus, and it's 100%, and the sky's the limit. And so I'm, I would have liked to have heard from staff a little bit more the bad news, in a way, of what we're facing here in terms of height. I appreciate the mayor's... Um, original scaling it down from what it was, which was sort of mind-boggling. I thought it was a sort of a joke until I realised, we all realised it wasn't. One question perhaps you could share for the public is, how can you legally cap a height in one area of town if it's free-for-all in other areas? Is that realistic or is it just hopeful? And so I'd like a lot more realism perhaps from staff as we go forward, just in terms of visual aids, a little pointer mm -hmm. at where you're looking at on the map would be very helpful for those of us in the audience. And lastly, I know there'll be a lot of chance with the, um, the EIR, but don't forget that this corridor is where the whole Lower West Side accesses the other side of town, not just visitors. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Greensight. Do we have someone else online, Ms. Bush? We'll take that person online. Good evening. Welcome to the council meeting. Person Good online. evening, Mayor Keeley, council members. Uh, this is Chris Murphy, president of the Warriors. Um, appreciate everybody's time today. Sorry that I couldn't be there in person. Um, I just wanted to make two quick comments. Uh, one, uh, you know, reaffirming the Warriors' commitment to to an arena in Santa Cruz and wanting to call this area home for a long time to come. Fred and I had another conversation today, um, you know, really just talking through the how important it is for, for us as the Warriors. This has been our home for the last 13 years, 12, 13 years, and this is where we'd like to be able to work together with the community, with the city, with other partners to, to make a permanent home um, that we're really excited about. Uh, we also talked uh, further, Fred and I, about kind of the, the 12 stories, approximately 1,600 units, 20% affordable component. Um, you know, and I had another conversation with the development group that we're working with uh, and just want to reaffirm for all as well that, like, we're, we're very much still on board with this plan and, and support this plan. Um, no, there, there are still so many things that are unknown, as, as everybody has been mentioned today. There's still a lot of variables out there. Um, there's no concrete plan, you know, set to share today. Um, but what we are committed to is like continuing to hear community feedback from all walks of the community, continuing to be a good partner um, to the community of Santa Cruz and to the city of Santa Cruz and the county, uh, and to hopefully continue to be able to make memories here in Santa Cruz for a really long time to come. So thank you, um, Mayor Keeley all council members, the, the commission, um, and the city staff that's been amazing to work with so far. Um, so thank you. I uh, appreciate everybody's efforts, and we'll continue to work together towards making this a reality. Mr. Murphy, thank you very much, and happy birthday to your daughter. That's why he's not here. He's with his daughter on her birthday. Good evening, sir. Thanks, Fred. You're welcome. Thank you, Mayor Keeley, Council, and Planning Commissioners. My name is Jim Sandoval, and uh, I'm a resident of Beach Hill, 3rd Street. And um, we have a great neighborhood, and I'd say in the last 10 years, it's become more of a neighborhood. When, we, when I first moved there 20 years ago, it was very much 
a tourist and student type neighborhood uh, with just a lot of changeover. So uh, we're feeling like, um, gosh, we wish we were a neighborhood conservation zone because uh, we're a historic area and we have block parties and we visit each other and have dinner parties. And so, um, you know, this plan uh, could be a great thing. Uh, you know, we're worried about the biggest thing is traffic. Um, you know, the elephant in the room is that it's currently gridlocked during the summer. Mm -hmm. And none of us can leave our homes on Saturdays or Sundays to go to Shopper's Corner or San Lorenzo Lumber uh, after 10 a.m. because it, it literally takes an hour to get home. And so you all are a lot of smart people that can kind of figure out a way. Let's, if we're going to bring in 1,600 housing units and big commercial space and an arena with 200 or more events a year, I mean, there's going to be a lot of perfect storms that could happen with traffic. You know, how, are we, how can we divert the current tourist traffic from this whole area? All the wayfinding apps have made every street in, in the whole beach area discoverable. And so it's literal gridlock. Um, so this is an opportunity, a big opportunity to, you know, create this development, but also address a big issue that's, you know, citywide, and it'll become more citywide uh, as this thing expands. Um, I totally agree with uh, Mr. Schifrin and Mr. Barron about, um, you know, sticking with existing zoning heights and density will get you to what you want with uh, the numbers, uh, given the density bonuses and whatnot. So I totally concur with that. Um, and then also, um, you know, the plan calls to preserve view corridors for the new developments and uh, also to um, minimize development impacts on existing residential uses. So kind of with that in mind, um, you know, what about us? You know, can you somehow articulate the buildings in a way, you know, maybe mix some of the red with the purple so that, you know, there's some articulation so that we do still have some of our beautiful views of the mountains and that the people in Solo will have views of Beach Hill and the old Victorians and so forth. So I really encourage you to think about that um, and protect us in that way. Um, and I like the gondola idea or the, the PRT. Um, I think Ed Porter first... Uh, presented that years ago. So thank you. Thank you so much. Another person online, Ms. Bush. We'll take that person. Good evening, person online. Welcome. Good evening. Uh, this is Rafa Sonnenfeld. Uh, overall, just wanted to commend the planning staff for a really thoughtful uh, presentation. Um, especially appreciated the um, the thought around the uh, dedicated bike lanes and protected bike lanes and uh, the uh, the the design standards overall, I think, are are, are uh, relatively good for our community. Uh, I don't think they're a sea change compared to what exists now, but but they're a, a, a modest uh, uh, movement in the right direction. Um, one uh, thing that I'm somewhat concerned about is um, the circulation plan does call for um, a lot of essentially. Street widening um, uh, with through land dedications in order to um, have those uh, uh, the combination of protected bike lanes and parking and two two lanes of traffic in each direction. Um, I think we can do everything that we want or most things that we want without needing to widen the roads um, and without needing to dedicate private land to do that. And I question, um, you know. Each parking space uh, can be somewhere between 300 and 350 square feet. That's the same amount of space as a, a small studio apartment. Um, Pacific Avenue, south of Laurel, uh, there's about 20 parking spaces on each side of the street. Um, that's not a whole lot of parking, but you know, uh, it's if if you're keeping that parking in place in order to. Uh, 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 you know, re redesign your neighborhood and 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 you're not uh, we're eliminating some of that parking in order to create a uh, uh, more pedestrian friendly more pedestrian or more bike friendly neighborhoods then potentially you're you're leaving housing units on the table you know uh, at 10 stories uh 
20, 20 parking spaces is that's 20 units. That's 200 units potentially of, of housing that just evaporate if we have to, uh, uh, widen the street. So, so my question is whether or not, uh, the the densities the housing densities that we're, we're thinking about when we're in this uh south of the laurel plan include the land that would be dedicated to widening the highways or if, or if that's hasn't been factored in um i just encourage the city to to rethink having all of that together um definitely want to see protected bike lanes but i don't think we necessarily need you know uh dedicated traffic lanes in both directions or or parking on both sides of the street. I definitely remove parking on at least one side of the street in order to avoid having to widen the high the widen the roads. Anyway, overall good job. Thanks very much. Thank you, sir. Good evening. Welcome. Good evening. My name is Jack Lee. Um Hi Mayor, council, council member and the Plan Commission. So I'm actually Jim's next door neighbor. So I see the same view, same traffic gridlock every weekend. And, uh, and the thing, so one point about the lower extension that you guys wanted to move more backward toward the beach, that's actually a really bad idea because that, that road actually helps decongest some of the traffic to beach hills. So I think that if we were gonna do anything about that extension, we should push a little bit farther away from the beach so have better access. And another point is that that area is so great like with traffic, right? How about if we push the traffic further back? So for example, if we could get that, that picture, the vision that the other gentleman showed that we're not gonna get the big plaza with all beautiful buildings, right? If we make that completely car free, and then we build a, a parking lot right at where the, the, the soccer field is right now, or you know some kind of traffic management. So all of the beach traffic comes in they park at that area. We can have gondolas, we can have trolleys, and we can bus people around. So that way we re completely reduce the traffic, but still allow public to ask the beat, access the beach. And then at the same time, if we look at another different angle that you, A, B, C, D, those blocks, if we dedicate it to more business area, if we move all the business, the bookstore, everything from downtown to that area, and then dedicate that into a big, area where we have grocery store, we can buy groceries. Like, so, so it's not just when the summer is busy, it's vibrant, but when it's off season, it, people still have a place to go, have a gym, have you know, other stuff there. And then while vacating some of the business in downtown, we have more capacity there to put more buildings. So, so we're not necessarily crowding that, that front area where we have a beautiful town, beautiful view of, of beach hills, and then if you build a building way too high, we're not going to get that beautiful sun shine that they're showing in the picture. Anyway, that's all I have. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Another person online? No one online. Good evening. Welcome. Uh, thank you so much. Would you be kind enough to, you have a oh. very soft voice. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, my name um, is Lucy Yin. Uh, thank you so much, um, uh, Mayor Nini and uh, the council members. And thank you so much um, uh, 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 for the planning committee, uh, for the wonderful uh, presentation. Um, I'm here, um, I want to see two things. Um, so personally, um, I heard a lot of um, comments from online about um, completely get rid of cars, um, um, uh, you know, um, so build um, less parking. And I just want to talk about my personal experience. Um, my younger son was born in Santa Cruz. Uh, for me to be able to support them to enjoy this beautiful city of Santa Cruz, I have to commute 100 miles a day so that our family can live here. I came home every day about 7.30 to 8. Think about, at that time, I'm eager to get 
to my child, and I cannot access my home. I cannot find parking. So what can I feel? For this 1,000, oh, almost 2,000 new units, I, would, I cannot help but sympathize the working mothers and fathers, how, how their life will be. If Santa Cruz is not only a tourist town, it's, it's our home. It's, it's those people sitting behind you. This is our home. And I tried so hard to make a living here. So please, so whatever the planet, maximum the unit might not be the best way to benefit everyone. So the downtown area is already so congested. And um, I want to see, so second thing, when I saw the 85 feet building around Beach Hill area, I cannot help but think, can I, can I, like how I could help and um, now thinking, and my kids growing up thinking like this plan only benefits a few have the have the means to be able to live in those 85 feet building and how they would think about it going up here and blocking the sun, sunlight to their bedroom and the whole city center they are so enthusiastically Thank you for your testimony. Thank yes, you very much. Yes, Thank you so much. Appreciate your presence here. Thank you. Good evening, sir. Welcome. Mayor, council members, commissioners. Uh, I am Keith Christman. I own 212 Cedar Street right next to Foster Freeze. And I, I'm a house that got lumped into this whole arrangement. And I think my biggest concern, like everyone here, that I've heard so far, living in the reality of it is parking and lack of infrastructure. Um, I also heard that this new zoning would limit the qualifications for who gets a parking pass within those new zones. So I don't even know if I, that's something I need to look into. I don't know if I would qualify for a parking pass because I'm now rezoned into this um, development area. Um, so yeah, that that's basically it seems like a lot of good work's gone into this. It would be awesome to build up this area, but it seems like the current infrastructure that we have for parking and transportation doesn't exist with the amount of people we're expecting to come in there. And it seems also like the FAR current zoning, the allowable FAR numbers that people have brought up would allow you to hit your 1,600 units given the 100%. So it doesn't seem like it's necessary for this rezoning. Those are my, those are my main comments. Thank you. Thank you so much for being here. We have a person online. We'll take that person and we'll be right with you. Good evening, person online. Welcome. Three, two, one. Good evening. Hello, everyone. I wasn't planning on talking. I've never spoken at one of these functions or been in this room, so bear with me. Um, I'm, I'll speak on a couple of experiences of mine. I'm um, a resident here, and I do work. I'm a co-owner of a business in the, one of the blocks. Um, the, I work at the Bike Church. We're part of the Hub for Sustainable Living. That site houses... Uh, various nonprofits that provide very important services, like the Tenant Sanctuary, the Bike Church, um, and various other uh, businesses. And we're just, or I'll speak on my my experience. <clears throat> Receiving reviewing information like this is scary for us. Um, it's hard to imagine us fitting into this new vision of the downtown, and it, for me, I think reinforces. The sense of gentrification occurring and it's hard to know where to look to relocate um, and I imagine other businesses like ours like we're not we're not we don't own the building um, 
so where where will we go? Um, I don't know, and I would appreciate. I'm looking forward to the business meet, business owners meeting next week, and I'm curious how we will respond over the years. As we know, you know, it's our business, the landowner's decision. So um, that's just our experience, my experience. Um, and then personally, I I've lived in Santa Cruz for seven years. I'm a small business owner. I run a small engineering consulting company. It's just me trying to um, do good and support myself. I don't have any dependents. I'm a renter. I'd love to call Santa Cruz my home for as long as possible. Um, and read, yeah, reading a plan like this, I see the, the tall housing and I still don't think, I, I don't see it. I don't see me in it. It still seems so inaccessible and unaffordable and going through Pacific now I see the you know the new buildings and I I don't want to like I think housing need, is needed but I like I struggle seeing myself in it just based on affordability like I just looked up the new um, a new downtown development of single bedroom is three thousand dollars starting a month and I don't know. I guess it's just pretty intimidating, and I, I don't want to leave Santa Cruz. I love it here, and it's just hard to keep that momentum in me going. And things like this kind of chip away at my um, perseverance in that. So, don't really have any specific feedback. Just wanted to share my experience in this since I was here. Um, oh, and I just have one more comment. Doesn't the the what is it? Cities like housing allocation don't really need. To 3,700 units. Mm -hmm. So this is like a ton of housing compared to what the whole city is expected. So just a thought. Thanks. Thank, well, thank you for being here tonight. Hope you come back again. Good evening. Good evening, sir. And this is not your first appearance here. <laughs> um, by the way, uh, I was wondering if maybe you could give me a few extra seconds or time for folks that are really impacted by this development. Uh, myself, Joe already spoke, but uh, I own the property at Spruce and um, Pacific, yeah. uh, 18th unit apartment building, or as Owen Lawler calls it, Main on Main. Um, but I got a couple questions. Actually, Bonnie, if you could pick up the, uh, put up that. One question is, is the city prepared to do eminent domain in order to acquire the properties for this uh, development? I took this picture, I took this picture in Amsterdam, by the way. Kind of role reversal. If you can see it circled, that is somebody that held out and would not give in to the hotel development. I call that Joe. That, in fact, that's, that could be Joe Quigg right there, his building. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm curious, you know, of course, I'm not going to get an answer here at this meeting, but what, it, what, what are we going to be doing? What's the plans to prevent something like that from happening? It could be me, for instance. Um, I'm in domain. Um, but here, let's be more serious. Have there been any studies done, market studies done, who is going to rent these brand new units, which are hundreds are going up. Anton is $3,100 for a studio. You've got 200 units going up on front and 1,600 units in this area. Let's face it, you know, the elephant's in the room. It's gonna be called, it's tech um, Silicon Valley workers that are gonna be living in these places. That's good, and you know, that's, like, let's, that's actually not a bad thing. A, they bring a lot of disposable income, which will, can be spent on the retail. I don't think we need affordable retail if we have tech workers in these, in these units, because they'll spend $5 on avocado toast and foo-foo coffee and, you know, $6 grilled cheese, which will, and let's face it, they kill two birds with one stone. This, this could be the, the key to solving the city's financial problems and future problems. <clears throat> okay, so, but those workers, see, this stuff, this density works in San Francisco and New York City and so forth. Why? Because the jobs are blocks or a subway right away. The jobs for this are over the hill. Those folks are going to have cars. So it's a fever dream to assume that, oh, people are going to get out of their cars and be on their little electric bikes and so forth. It's not going to happen. So one thing I would suggest is we need to accommodate parking for the Google buses and the other buses that are in Scotts Valley and so forth. I think you should include a nice bus area for those sleek, 
Wi-Fi enabled buses that are going to be carrying all these tech workers who are going to be the residents at this at these places. And UCSC, the salaries at UCSC are pitifully low. They can't even afford, you know, probably half of the uh, employees can't even afford these kinds of, of, of places. Anyway, so the other one is, I'm disappointed to see that there's no more discussion of a hotel, a really grand, nice hotel at the point, at the, where the car lot is. That would be, um, a, you know, a real signature project for the city. It would really lessen car needs because the tourists may not have cars, you know. So I'd like to see a hotel down there at the point, called the point, maybe for that matter. Uh, tech bus parking, hotel. What else? What's the warrior's preference in terms of um, segment D or segment E? I'm kind of, I'd be curious to know what their, what their preference is. Um, tech bus, where, but again, the thing is, who, has there been demand, like Nanda on Pacific, okay? It's been around for several years. Anybody know what the occupancy rate is? What's the demographic? Because that's going to be the same demographic for this kind of property. Um, Oh, I'm 44 seconds over. I'm sorry. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Another person online? We'll take a person online and we'll be right with you. Good evening, person online. Welcome. Person online, good evening. Good evening, uh, Planning Commission, City Council members. Good evening. Uh, my, my name is Alberto Lucero with the uh, Carpenters Local Union, local, uh, local 505. And it's uh, great to see these... Uh, there's new plans for the city of uh, Santa Cruz. Great to see new development. But it's also be greater to see if we are uh, in the future or now we have actually some, some various standards on the, on the who's gonna build a project for the construction workers that will include uh, healthcare, apprenticeship and local hire. Um, many times uh, workers like myself have to travel away from the city and then commute long hours. And this specific plan will actually Give give an opportunity to this uh, the the local community to work in the, in their community and get involved. Also, will give the the opportunity to have healthcare for the family, so they don't become a burden to the system. And apprenticeship, new people, people coming, you know, people that come out of high school, women, minorities, given the opportunity to go into an apprenticeship and build a career and actually live the make you know make the American dream come true by a property living in, in San Santa Cruz. This definitely will make a difference in the city and actually will make a difference for the uh, construction workers in the future of Santa Cruz. Thank you for your time. Well, thank you very much. Good evening, sir. Welcome. Um, this is my first one of these things I've been to, so thanks for being patient and thanks for all the information that's given, thank you given for out being tonight. Patient. Thank you. Um, a quick comment on some of the stuff that was presented. There was a lot of talk about that ABC. D block, but the red line and things that are proposed is much, much larger, and there wasn't a lot of information given about that, and that's honestly a lot of the area that I'm personally concerned about, um, so it would be great to shed some light on that, um, and I'm glad, you know, a few other people have mentioned it today, but, like, let's be honest about the type of people that will probably be renting these places out and living in them. Um, you know, think about who our community is going to be made up of, like $3,000 a month for a studio. There's not a lot of jobs in Santa Cruz that can afford that kind of money. Um, that is going to be a lot of over the hill people. A lot of those people don't want to take a bus. They run on their own schedule. Um, I don't think we're setting ourselves up in a good position to have people who are really wanting to stay in the community long term and invest in it and like actually care about it. Um, I don't work here. I don't own a house. I've been here for 10 years. Um, I came to work in the bike industry. I'm all about the bicycles and the riding and like that's my life. I love it. I drive an hour over the hill back and forth every single day to get to work. Like if anybody could work here and just ride a bike to work, I would do it. Um, you know, engineering bikes is what I do. Mm. And there's more bicycle companies and bike industry jobs in Santa Cruz than anywhere else in the United States. And I'm still like 10 years of working at a bike company over the hill, just like waiting for an opportunity to open up. Still not here. Um, so 
I just would encourage everyone to think about who would actually rent these out and is this the direction that we want our community to go or not. Thank you for being here. Thank you for your testimony. Ms. Bush, anyone else online? Last call if anybody would like to provide input or testimony. Seeing here none the matters back before the two bodies. Uh, I wonder if what we might do is, Ms. Bush, if you could bring this document up. Um, I'm wondering, uh, I'm going to ask Mr. Van Waugh and Mr. Butler this question. Am I right in thinking that as you have gotten individual feedback around here from both commissioners and council members, you've been noting those and that is providing you with a form of direction on this, is that correct? Okay. Uh, the reason I am asking you to look at this, and I think everybody should have a copy of this, there is one change. Mr. Butler, will you, uh, I want you, I, I worked with a number of people on this, but I want to, draw your attention to the words in red because that is different than what you see on the piece of paper and I am in agreement with Mr. Butler on, on, on that change. But let me tell you what, how at least one way to look at this. I think a way that the planning staff is looking at this is to say, I think if what we want to do is stay within the 12-story cap, 1,600 units, 20% of it being affordable after density bonuses. So that, that's our policy. What's our best chance to get there? I think planning has got a way to do that, and I think it is providing incentives to keep it 12 stories or less. That is a way to do it, and I want them to examine that. I think that's absolutely the right thing to do. I think I'd like them to examine another possibility too, and that is saying, you have to earn your way to 12 stories as opposed to try to stay under 12. That is a way to do it, I understand. This is designed to see if we can turn that a bit on his head and ask that to be evaluated. Now, I went through this with, as Mr. Murphy indicated earlier, uh, with him, I went over this with Mr. Butler, I've gone over this with, with quite a few folks to try to see if there's a way to create the incentives to earn your way to 12 stories. And it is a little different than how I had originally thought about it a few days ago. And this is a result of discussions with a lot of folks. But let me step you through it. The leave the existing general plan densities in place for blocks B, D, and H, and they'll be, dis they'll be studied at the 3.5 FAR. That is, a, is, is an effort to start with this idea that you have to earn your way to 12 stories. The affordable housing overlay, I think, that's, I think we see that in a quite similar way, doing that. The uh, item three provides incentives in the affordable housing overlay to allow increases in the FAR to a point that sufficiently increases the use of the city's density bonus law, thus increase, you can read it yourselves. The idea here is that we would also be saying, earn your way to these 12 stories as a way to try to keep them capped at, at 12. And uh, uh, I think this, if it is analyzed in parallel, with what is being suggested here, we may be able to have some choices as we go forward. If I understand what we're doing here this evening, it is to provide the kind of direction so that as we enter the CEQA process, we are clear on what we are subjecting to the CEQA process. And so uh, that is the spirit behind this is to uh, try to have an other way of trying to respect what is our current public policy of 12 stories, 1,600 units, 20% of all units are affordable. Mr. Butler has repeatedly said since January of 2023 that 
getting, uh, that achieving those goals requires threading multiple needles, none of which are stationary. <laughs> and other needles are being added as time moves on. It's a very, very difficult task, and I, I, I recognize that. But none of us are afraid of hard work, and the planning department isn't afraid of hard work. So I think that by having another possible way uh, will give us uh, some options that, are, that would be helpful. I'd be interested in any of your comments, but as you know, what we're trying to do here this evening is see if we can do things by consensus. And what I would ask after you've made any comments is that by consensus, we refer this to the department uh, as indicated on this, on this document. So let me entertain uh, comments or questions on this if people may have them. Not everybody at once, so. Okay, there we go. <laughs> yes, please. <laughs> Mr. Butler, come on up here. <laughs> I'm going to need your help. <laughs> Actually, are you asking for comments on this or just general comments? Oh, I think general comments. Okay, but good. if you have comments on this, that's No, fine. I just My wanted to clarify. I have general comments. I please didn't do. know if now you want please to. Please do. Um, let's see. I guess I... I would ask, um, um, I think it would be helpful to provide direction that going forward with this plan, that there it was very clear that there's a lot of missing information um, in terms of context of housing around um, the area. Um, we have, it just seems like everything always refers to Anton Pacific, the one new building at the corner and their rental rates. And so really pulling in and including all the developments in the area, four of them are low income, affordable, 100% affordable, 525 seater, fully leased. I, you know, the people living there, I met a single mom and her kid. I met a Spanish speaking woman who, you know, she's trying to get her family all together. And, I mean, there's various diverse groups of people living in these new developments, and and not all of them are the market rate building at the corner of Laurel and Pacific. The building right next to that is one of those projects, and the Metro upcoming building will be another one. And so I just think having um, that context will be helpful for everyone in terms of providing meaningful input. Because if we just look at that plan and that housing and those commercial spaces without knowing everything else that's already happening around, it it's just, mm -hmm. I think we can achieve a lot more. And I know it feels like we have that information out there in so many ways, but um, you know, I just think it's clear to just reiterate um, the occupancy, the rental rates, the, the, the housing that is around, and um, the mix of um, income housing and how important that is to have a diverse and thriving um, city center. And that is essentially a city center area. Um, so that was just kind of the direction I think is going to be so crucial moving forward. Um, and that was my first thought. So I didn't want to lose that. I'm going to pass it because there's so many of us. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure some of my other thoughts are um, will be asked. And if they aren't, I'll come back around. Uh, I'm going to work this way. Okay. Council Member Collins R. Johnson. OK, thank you. Um, we're good. Okay. okay. <laughs> Councilmember. Um, okay. Uh, just a, a couple of thoughts and comments. Uh, myself and, and Councilmember Newsom and the mayor have served on this ad hoc committee um, and have been witness to the tremendous amount of work and the lift it's taken for, for staff to bring this forward. So I just want to acknowledge and thank the team um, for getting us to this place. Um, I think what the mayor has proposed here does get to a lot of what we are trying to accomplish 
with this vision. I hear the concerns of community members who've spoken up about the anxiety uh, and trepidations around this change. It's, it's big and it's an opportunity. Um, it's an opportunity for us to create a new neighborhood. And that's how I keep thinking about it. It's a neighborhood and we can do this right. I think this helps get us there. How I see this is it's helping us maintain somewhat of the local control that we don't have. That's, that's how I see um, this incentive portion of what the mayor has put forward. So um, yeah, I think that, that in order for us to get there, to create this vibrant new neighborhood, we do need to continue to hear each other and listen to each other. Uh, we need to be open-minded. We need to be open to stretching ourselves and to innovate together. Uh, I'm, I'm very excited. I think there's a lot of work. There are hurdles that we heard about tonight that we haven't thought through thoroughly yet that we'll need to. Uh, and I do have further direction. Uh, I don't know if we want that now or after everyone is shared. I think what might be helpful is if you do that now and then folks will be able right. to think about it as we're so, moving around. Great, so uh, the further direction I have, and, and I did email it to um, Bonnie and I could forward it to you as well, or here she, here she is. Um, but I'll, I'll, I'll say it, and Bonnie, I emailed you this direction. So uh, to further study and include options for financing public infrastructure and public parking improvements in the plan, including but not limited to additional impact fees and infrastructure financing districts. and. Ms. Bush can hopefully bring that up. Okay, thank you. But I am, uh, I think this gets us to where we want to go. Fair enough. Uh, we will, as, as we've heard from people, then I'm going to, at the end of all this, ask if uh, we can refer all of this by consensus. That's what we'll do. So be thinking if you have a concern about, as people are saying, I want to provide this additional direction and so on, keep in mind that you're going to be willing to agree with uh, uh, Vice Mayor, Madam Vice Mayor. Thank you. Um, I appreciate the work that went into this, and I understand and support the spirit of what you've put forward here. Um, I agree with what you said about looking at the whole mm -hmm. new development holistically. Mm -hmm. I think if we're just looking at only the number of affordable units as a percentage or a number, that's great, but if it's not a local preference, if it's just people coming from wherever, which is what I've seen in some of the places, um, then that's not solving any of our problems. So um, I also would like to just note that although $3,000 for a studio seems like sticker shock, a brand new teacher could afford that, a firefighter could afford that, other people that are, I would consider us, you know, blue collar working people that didn't want to live, um, with roommates, someone could afford that. Um, and as I was looking on Craigslist, there was also, if you don't wanna pay 3,000 for a new studio, you can still find duplexes that are two bedrooms around town for 3,000 um, or other options. So there's, and maybe they're not in the same, they're, they're older, right? Mm -hmm. And so I think if people are gonna move into these units and maybe there's no parking, People that have two cars are going to choose to live there. They're going to choose to live in a different neighborhood. And so um, while I agree with our team that we do need parking um, down there to attract people from throughout the region, um, I, I don't know what that would look like, and I don't know how we can require it, but I think it is something to consider if we want to make it a, an attractive option for people to come down and, and use the space. I really loved that Spruce Street um, Plaza area and kind of the, the trees and things that I saw there. I would love to see the trees kind of continuing over the river so we could have spaces. I know the whole levee has really uh, lost a lot of vegetation over the years, and so I think that's contributed to the um, inability for some of the salmonoids to mm -hmm. spawn. And so as we're looking at I know it's bigger, but I just want to keep that in mind that we're we're making spaces for the the, the fish and create when we're so we're 
creating pathways down to the rivers. Maybe there's opportunities for people to fish or paddle or swim in the future. My other um, little thoughts about this in terms of neighborhoods for people of all ages, like Council Member Watkins has said, we both love the ideas of little parks or parklets in places where people could be out with their kids or, or anybody of any age can use the space. Um, and I think that overall it's a really great project and a design before you guys were on the council. I was on this group years ago, and it, and it fundamentally, I feel like it hasn't changed from its original vision. And I, it was started way before I was on council, but I just really have, was excited about it. The first time I heard about it was from Ms. Lipsicum when I was running for council. And I just think it's wonderful, and I really would love to see us taking back some of the control that the state has taken away and bringing this future development and redevelopment to this area that I think would be an improvement from what it is right now. So that's it. I don't have anything to say. Thank, thank you. you. Madam Vice Mayor. Thank you. Council Member. Sure. Yeah, thank you. And, and thanks for all the comments and suggestions that have been brought forward. I think we do want to get creative about what kind of local control we can have in this kind of environment at the state level. Um, I, I I'm supportive of you know looking into these options as possible avenues to do that. I definitely support an idea of how we're going to be realistic about parking. I certainly am supportive of wanting to have alternative transportation options and we have to be realistic about parking. And I also want to acknowledge what our community said they wanted for this area, which is adding capacity for multi-family housing, opportunities for public amenities and to connect our downtown river and beach and certainly a, a, a permanent arena. And to do that, you have to holistically think about what that looks like. And that for, I, I don't know how, honestly, I, I don't know how we do multifamily housing under the environment we're in, in terms of how developers are trying to maximize affordability with smaller units. Mm -hmm. But that's contradictory for what our community is asking us to do. So if there's ways we can get creative about that, I think we need to, and we have to also understand that families require cars, usually. I mean, they don't need two necessarily, but generally one, and um, and that's just realistic. So if we're trying to build a community that's holistic for everybody and we're being responsive to what our community is saying they want us to be responsive to, creative solutions like this matter. I will also just add an additional point because I'm a supporter of Nexus Studies. I think it's important. There is impact to development and development can help pay for those impacts and a Nexus study helps us understand what those are. I, don't, I, I think that's a good thing. Mm -hmm. And I would say that with these higher developments that require um, you know, this larger infrastructure, what we've heard from our fire department is an interest in having a training center to be able to accommodate emergency situations to be prepared for that. So there is impact associated with how we are also thinking about the residual outcomes with what is being proposed by some of these developments. And frankly, I think they should help pay for that. So I'm supportive of the Nexus study suggestion. I think I made my comments earlier about thinking about um, the, the various design, I think it's 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 really exciting. And and I know it's nuanced. I know where, where we first started, we had more control than where we are now. Mm -hmm. um, so yes, I think we do want to make sure we can maintain that to the best of our ability and be able to make decisions to, to enable that. Um, and, you know, the Warriors have been amazing for our community. We want to support and celebrate them. They've been incredible in terms of what they've offered and continue to offer our community as well. So I just want to acknowledge that and thank Chris Murphy for, for calling in on his daughter's birthday. Um, <clears throat> and I think this is really exciting and I think we can balance, to, to some of my colleagues' points, we can balance all of it um, to the best of our ability. So thanks for the innovative solutions. Thank you. Council Member Brown. Thank you. Um, I just want to say a few kind of bigger picture th Things and then comment on the proposals we've heard from the mayor and council member Kalantari Johnson. Um, we heard a lot about people being worried about what this is going to mean in terms of quality of life impacts for people who um, may have stable housing and and are working hard to be able to maintain that, um, and from 
from runners, um, not many, but uh, from those who, who have no say in what happens to their housing, right, or their you know, place of business uh, should the owner, the property owners want to sell. Um, in the time I've, I've lived here for 35 years, um, I usually don't talk about, like, I've been here for so long, because people do that like it's some, you know, it gives you an, it, some additional right to have, have a, an opinion, right? Um, but I say that because um, what I've seen over those years is, um, you know, kind of a, a, a slow and steady march towards, you know, increased housing costs, um, you know, the gentrification of our community, if not the, um, the built environment, um, certainly who gets to live here. And, um, and, I've heard, and I have seen um, many of my own friends displaced. I made it 20 years here before I was displaced. Um, and in the time I've been on this council for, um, you know, in eight years, the median income in this community has almost doubled. And uh, rent, median rents have more than doubled. Um, and in, in less than a decade. So when we think about, you know, we can say, well, we don't, you know, of course our intention isn't gentrification, but that's just what's happening, and it's going to continue to happen. And the question is, how much do we want to try to push back on that, um, or do we want to facilitate that? Um, and so every time we talk about upzoning and how, what a great, how great it's going to be when those property values go up, we're also talking about the, the cost for developers, that's going up, right? The land, it, it it's, gets capitalized and then in, into the rents. Um, and every, so it doesn't really benefit everyone. It may benefit the city and in increased real estate, you know, um, property taxes, but it's not really benefiting everybody. It's, and it means that more and more people are being pushed out. And I just have to say that because um, this isn't about like, oh, change is hard. You know, we hear change is hard and, you know, tall buildings scare people, but they shouldn't. This is about who gets to live here and what kind of community we want to have. And many of you tonight made that point. Um, I, Mr. Mosanin has left, but um, or I think he's left. He'd be maybe shocked to hear me say, I completely agree that some kind of analysis needs to be done about um, the potential for to fill these spaces. Um, because who can afford those rents? Well, yeah, tech, you know, young people who are kind of starting, no families are not going to move into a $3,000 a month studio, right? You know, if a firefighter wants to be single their whole life, they could afford to live alone, or, or you know, actually, firefighters make a little bit more than that. But teachers, nurses, right? Um, if they want to live alone their whole life, then they can find a place, right? That, those are the realities that we are are facing here, and so, and and I want to also bring up, um, and it, it's kind of connected to um, Mr. Mosenden's point. Uh, Councilmember Bruner, you mentioned, you know, well, we, everybody's talking about Anton, right? And everybody's talking about the clock tower. I think these are opportunities for us to see what actually is coming and to think about the reality of that. And that's why people are focusing on those. And um, yes, 525 uh, Cedar filled. That's an affordable housing project. Mm -hmm. Anton Pacific, 13%. You have to have $10,000 in the bank to move into a studio. Yeah, 13%. So, um, and we know that some of those other, the other um, kind of market rate developments um, that came in before density bonus, before, you know, that some of us were already uncomfortable with, um, are not all full either. So, you know, but those new, those new units are going to set the market, right? They're going to set the market. And, um, and, and they can hold those units empty. Um, and write-off losses, uh, and so th the incentive to build affordable housing is l very, very minimal. And so, I, so now I'll just, that was my kind of soapbox. Um, <laughs> I'll say I think that, um, I also recognize that, you know, it's, change is going to happen. The state has um, taken away a lot of our authority, um, but where we can, we should. 
And, um, and so I think that, you know, really this, I, I really like the idea of the affordable housing overlay. Um, and so I appreciate that that's shown up here. And I think there is more work to be done um, to, to try to think about how um, that could, might be utilized. Um, and I really think that most of all, flipping this on its head and, and causing developers to think about earning that density and height rather than coming to us and saying, well, by right, you have to give it to us um, and, you know, and we could, all, we could ask for more, right? Th that is, I think it's brilliant. <laughs> so I really absolutely support that. I support um, Council Member Calentari Johnson, your suggestion as well, because I, I as I asked in the early uh, stages of our, the presentation, I am concerned about how the city might finance all this. We, you know, we delay capital projects <laughs> for our, what we already have. And so, um, and there isn't gonna be huge grant funding available, um, at least not in the near term. So we do have to think about um, how that's gonna get funded and putting ourselves into a ton of debt with the expectation that all of this is gonna fill up and pay itself off is not um, good, good planning. So um, I, I think that, um, moving in this direction and really trying to um, impress upon our planning staff that this is a priority for this council is a, is a good idea. Um, my preference would be to leave um, the BD and H blocks um, uh, as per unit um, rather than FAR because FAR is really why we have no height limits, <laughs> right? If it was a number of units, we'd, um, we could maintain a little bit more of a, um, you know, not control. Well, control. Yeah, I'll just, I'll just say that. Um, but I'm willing to consent around this as long as we are not talking about increasing the far beyond that, because really 3.5 is 7, as Mr. Schifrin said earlier. Mm -hmm. um, so I'll leave it there. Um, I think that, oh, another thing I did want to say, it was a question I meant to ask. Um, in terms of community engagement, the staff report gave us a taste of, of or actually the, the whole inventory of the work that you've done. But I'd like to hear about engagement of tenants. Um, there are business owner tenants um, who I guess have been invited to a meeting. That's great to hear. Um, but that, those are the folks who are going to suffer um, if they don't get to have some voice in this and, and hopefully come up with some ways to deal with those relocation issues um, in, a, in a way that actually works. So um, please engage with everybody in the south of Laurel area and, this, and the surrounds um, and not just property owners. I recognize they have a lot of power because they own property, but there are a lot of people who are going to be affected. Um, we also heard from neighbors about kind of traffic, et cetera. And I think those are all critical. I'm not going to, you know, expound on that. Um, I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member. Council Member Newsom. Thank you, Mayor Keeley. Yes, uh, I just want to start by thanking staff for all of their work that they've done and uh, on this plan and bringing this forward. Uh, and also, I uh, want to thank uh, Mayor Keeley for uh, bringing this forward. And I think this is responsive to what we've heard tonight and will help us keep some, more of our, some, a little bit more of our local control, as my colleagues have said, and something I support. Uh, we've heard a, you know, we've heard tonight um, several times about who will get to uh, live here and who will get to live in this area. And you know, we're, we're calling for 1,600 units. Uh, Three, at least 320 of which will be affordable housing units or 20%, possibly more, depending on uh, the direction we go. Um, and I uh, do want to say that we, you know, we do have local preference on the books for local preference and if you work locally. Uh, and I've also had conversations with uh, Planning Director Butler about a new state bill that passed last year, SB 649, that actually broadens the categories that can be provided for a local preference. So. One could be possi uh, one possibility could be um, uh, those who inhabit low income areas that are already affected by displacement having a preference as well. Uh, and it is my understanding that the planning department is working on on researching that bill and and finding the various new categories that can be added to those preferences. And I just want to really urge the, uh, the planning department to continue that work and to bring forward. Uh, 
you know, the, the final product that will work at the earliest possible date for council to consider. Uh, I think that'd be really great to add more, more, um, uh, more preferences that can, you know, allow for community members to stay here and, and to live in this area and to help this area thrive. So, thank you. Thank you, <laughs> sir. Commissioner Thompson. <laughs> oh, where to begin? Um, uh, actually, I think that um, the place to begin is to crunch some numbers. Um, uh, this is the first time I've had a chance to kind of see the numbers that have been already <coughs> bounced around. Um, uh, but it, it does seem uh, very promising to me that we have some numbers uh, right on your handout tonight. Uh, and it would be worthwhile to um, a, a do some tests um, on this. Uh, one of the things that's a, um, a, an important vari um, variable is just the size of dwelling units. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, we have um, uh, two different measures, and one is the FAR, which kind of tells you what the gross uh, envelope is, um, and that's usually not very flexible, so um, that's a good parameter to start out with. And then um, you can set some goals for how many actual dwelling units, how many kitchens um, do you um, want to have. And um, the math there just comes down to, so what's the range of unit sizes? And uh, one of the things that I have strong feelings about is that we still have a desperate undersupply of small units. And it's just, a, it's just, a, it's just the math. Um, uh, and that is to say we have a lot of single people who share housing because that's the only way they can afford to keep a roof over their head. They, they don't want to have a roommate. They'd rather have a place of their own. So uh, coming up with a neighborhood that's very urban um, that is close to a lot of the support elements uh, that we look for in a community, happen to be downtown. It's a pretty good location for small households. Um, and so um, let's play with some numbers here for a bit and use the 3.5 uh, lid, but then ask ourselves, so um, <clears throat> how would the math work out with different... Uh, household sizes, and uh, and what would that really um, mean for uh, the character of the neighborhood as well? Um, single people use uh, services outside the home at a greater uh, uh, level than uh, families do. Uh, so that's also a good fit with what we are likely to find in downtown, uh, the the second or third places that uh, we we enjoy in our downtowns. Um, so I'm th this is really um, staff work, but um, I'm perfectly willing to roll up my sleeves and look at it too. Um, it, but just do the math. Let's just kind of figure out. Um, um, my sense is that the 12-story thing might not turn out to be as interesting as uh, folks think because at um, a floor area ratio of 3.5, we probably don't need to go above the uh, kind of eight-story limit, which is the affordable height um, for residential construction. So um, uh, that would be my recommendation. Let's, let's pl play with the numbers with our staff and see what kind of scenarios that produces. And then ask ourselves, so who do we want to be building this neighborhood for? I mean, the, the car is going to be a problem no matter what we do. So let's get the housing right first. Thank you, sir. Commissioner McKelvey. I think most of the comments I was going to make have been covered already. Um, thank you for engaging it so thoroughly. Um, I do want to say that for, for people's concerns about gentrification, density, et cetera, Density creates gravity in a place, and it makes it so that, you know, those retail and small business incubators, all those things, those are supported by the people, by people being able to access them as, as customers and patrons. And when you put people in a place, in, a, in, in a, an urban environment, 
your example, um, that's what supports those those ideas. And I think it's just to be encouraged at every opportunity. Um, about the, 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 I just want to reiterate something I said, I think in another meeting that it's exactly the case that when uh, a bunch of small households occupy one building, they would love to have another alternative uh, that would then free up that home for families. And the idea, that's, that's just something that happens in every community. And, but when you don't have the alternatives and you don't have the supply, that's impossible. And that's when prices go up too. So I just think that we need to really be mindful of not everyone is in the same housing demand circumstance. There have to be just as many different types of housing as we can possibly provide at, at every level, whether it's affordable or market rate or whether it's a three bedroom, two bath or a studio. And I, I just think we have to really dig in and try to figure out every opportunity for that. And overall, I just think this plan, thank you so much for the public, for the staff, everyone's uh, desire to make this something really great. And I think it's an opportunity that we have to just seize and try to do something with. Commissioner, thank you very much. Commissioner Kennedy. Uh, this is just so exciting to be here at the middle of the third act of our downtown. <laughs> um, kind of excited about it. Um, mm -hmm. So I have three kind of quick hits. I want to encourage staff, and I, me and Matt talked about this, but to keep adding graphics and drawings. I remember for the downtown plan that I worked a lot on, they're not like the most beautiful sketches I've ever seen, but the graphics that are in there tell the story. So I know you're doing that already, but uh, the architects I talk to say, we want those graphics. Those let us make buildings that aren't terrible. That gives me the ammo to say, no, I want a porch there or, a, or something like that. So keep that up and, and let's enhance that as much as we can. Um, the original Warriors Stadium, there's a great concern about shared parking. I'm not dismissing parking concerns. I hear you all. You know, I drive around all the time, as a fact. But I wonder if there's data that Claire could resurface on, like, did that affect the downtown parking district? I don't remember, but um, I'd like to hear that again if it's out there. Um, this is not the same, but it'd be a good comp, you know. Um, oh, gosh, I have to mention that the upside to the 100% density bonus, like, you get really tall buildings, but you also get a lot of affordable units. So I didn't hear that said enough today, that it's a weighing, and that's really important weight to me, even if they're 289 square feet, which is what I was working on at work today. Um, yeah, so I'm just thrilled. I can see this energy with this plan. And this, I think, is because the pendulum is swinging. When we worked on that last plan, we were in desperate straits. You know, we had terrible housing situation there. Um, so things have changed. The pendulum swinging back. Tourism is booming now. We're up 29%, right? Or whatever that number was. Oh, I love this one. The future is all electric. Nobody's arguing about that anymore. And we're gas burning in any of these buildings. Probably, <laughs> probably broad statement, Supreme Court aside. Um, we can talk about that later. Uh, we are gentrified. Like, I'll say it. We're way more gentrified than when I was at Santa Cruz High. No doubt about it. Let's acknowledge it. And uh, I personally think those affordable units are like the only tool we have to fight that. But that's just my opinion. Uh, Silicon Valley is here now. Like, everyone still has this, like, hole in the dike mentality. <laughs> Our planning director is from Santa Clara. Welcome, Lee. I love you. I'm so glad you came. He lived here. He lived here. Let's let's stop pretending we can hold that wave back. Acknowledge it and roll with it. You know, um, I'm getting to the end here. So the last two big ones on my bullet points are: now we are building enough housing at all income levels, and now we are even planning for enough housing. So we need to like take back our power here. And we're doing it when council pushed back on that. Development, I was like, right on, you know. So um, this is a different stance for this development discussion to happen. You know, we're hitting our goals. So then I wanted to wrap up uh, to respond to Renee, who I love your blunt comments. Uh, why are we even doing this? This is the third of three processes. The first was downtown had fallen down in 1989. Talk about desperate. Oh, man. I mean, I'm, 
a high schooler looking at big holes in the ground where the mm -hmm. bookshop was. Mm -hmm. um, the second one, not just because I was involved, because all sorts of factors is like the most successful you know, um, plan ever, and we're seeing the effects out here. Um, this is the next one. So, like, why are we even doing this? Even if certain developers think they can come in here and say, I don't care about your rules, we're going to build as high as you want. No, this is a community dialogue. This is how we define what we want and be clear with people about that. And they still have the option of saying, man, 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 but you know, this is, we need to do this. It's really important. I saw through oh, so many meetings how it worked on the last part. You know, developers behind closed doors saying, eee, that's going to be too expensive. Neighbors of all sorts, you know, so anyway, this is all happening and we just need to keep <coughs> it going. It's like we have the momentum. Um, oh, so I have one more quick one which may be controversial. I want to touch on lighting and dark sky. I got a, I worked really hard on lighting like for the Anton Pacific project and starting tonight for this week the building will be lit up on the outside at night so I'd encourage and invite you all to cruise by you know these plans and these buildings take so long that that was like before all the objective standards but just take a look and it, like I haven't even seen it yet so uh, I think that in this plan we're already really well addressing lighting but I want this to be dark on the river and super bright and active. And yeah, I gotta admit that LED screen, I did kind of go ee. But when I read about projections and 3D holographs, I'm like, that's great. That's what we want in our entertainment district. So continue that work to put the light where it's useful and we want it and not in our natural areas. Um, uh, so I'm good with all those consensus comments. Oh, the last one I wanna finish with is like my, from my heart, you know, India Joe's, like I can't imagine someone more Santa Cruz than India Joe's. He catered my wedding, you know, let's go down the list. <laughs> Through the years, moving from one space to the other, and I had such heartburn on that last downtown plan that we were like, you know, putting India Joe's basically out of business, because we did, you know. And, uh, I just, that's the, like the price of change, and if we want this new city, that has to be there. And you know, he ended up retiring. And just to bring it to a humorous conclusion, I just found in a box $107 gift certificate for India Joe's for my <laughs> wedding that I, I'm not going to be able to use. But hey, you know, he did what he wanted. These other businesses will relocate, so it will be OK. And it's worth it for this new thing we're going to get. Commissioner, thank you. Commissioner Dan? Uh, I'll be brief because I think we're at the point where it, almost everything's been said, but just not by me. Um, so I just want to say I strongly agree with Councilmember Watkins with what you said about parking. I think we need to live in reality that we need to deal with that. I live downtown, used to live on Beach Hill, so that's where I've been for the last 30 years. Also doesn't make my opinion more valid, <laughs> but I do think that the impacts are very real. I see them, mm -hmm. I empathize with the neighbors, and so I, you know, I just think that needs to be said. Like uh, Commissioner Kennedy said, this is going to bring about real change. So I appreciate your honesty. It's it's going to gentrify. It will put people out of business. Um, but there will also be positive positive things about it. The one thing I did want to address was um, how the improvements are going to be financed. And I think that this is really a really important component of this whole plan. And I appreciate um, Councilmember Calentary Johnson's um, additional direction um, wanting to be flexible about financing, um, I did have some concerns about um, the uh, redevelopment part duh kind of um, approach to this and that those tax increment improvements would go to the district, which I completely understand why that might be necessary and that might be the way the city needs to go. On the other hand, this a new neighborhood is undoubtedly going to cause a lot of impacts um, and there's an argument that the rest of the city should benefit from that there should be some public benefit to the rest of the city so um, I just you know this is the middle of the process not the end so um, just put, putting that out there as food for thought. thank you commissioner let me ask mr. Butler mr. Van Waugh clear you, you seek any clarification? Excuse me, I'm sorry. 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 Sor
I've I'm been silent the whole night. I apologize. So. <laughs> Please accept my apology. It's okay. Please. Um, I do want to thank the planning department for all this work and subcommittee. Um, one of the things that I've had conversations with Lee about and we see on the planning commission is, and you're seeing, is all these projects that are coming at us. And part of that, and it's been said in different ways, is that we're not creating a plan for ourselves. So it's just happening to us. And so it's really important that we take ownership in in making plans for ourselves and it may not we may not all agree on the location or any of these things but it's an opportunity here that we have to seize and we need to make decisions for ourselves otherwise it's just going to happen to us so i appreciate the effort being made um, to help us identify a plan i would say that the graphics and the photos um, are a little bit dangerous. I mean, what we saw tonight was like nothing over six stories, really, and huge plazas that aren't really what we're going to have, at least at this moment. And so it becomes, uh, particularly right now under the circumstances that we're experiencing here, is um, that we're dealing with a, a trust issue. And we're, and we're having to communicate with the community about that. And so we really do need to work on the level of transparency and communication that we're talking to the community about, about these projects. And so I just, as we move forward in this process, I just want to make sure that what we're showing the community is, is something that's more realistic um, or, or worst case scenario even, because it, it's, it's, it, that that's really what we're potentially up against. So, um, so I would I, I want to encourage us to to develop that a little bit further as we move forward with this. Um, I also wanted to say with um, Matt Matthew mentioned doing the math, and I think one of the things that comes up for me, and I know that Lee and the Planning Commission have heard this from me, is that. It is important for us to know how many of these individual, you know, small studio units are coming across um, the table or whatever we want to call it for approval because um, we do need diversity down there. We need diversity of units to create an active space. And so um, if, you know, if we're having developers come, you know, submitting different projects, but nobody's taking a look at how many of these single units that we have in totality over the next five years, we could find ourselves in, with a surplus that doesn't serve us is, is, is a feeling that I'm having recently for the units that we're seeing come across. So, um, so I don't know how we do that, but as we move forward with this, I think that that's an important part of the planning of, to create vibrancy down there. And also, single units create vibrancy. So there's that. But there's also others. So a diversity there and, and doing the math, I think, will do that. Um, I think specific questions I had, you know, and I, I do, because I waited all night, this is where we're at. But the EIR, I, I, I am curious, and we don't necessarily have to answer it tonight, but really having the community understand I know it's based on 1,800 units, um, but what does it look like with the Warriors Stadium events and then 200 additional events? Like, I'm just not really even clear, and I'm up here with all of you. <laughs> so, like, I don't really understand how the EIR really factors in all the things uh, when we don't actually know all the things yet, you know, in terms of what this area is going to fully be. So. That was kind of just a specific, a specific thing that I think the community is going to want more information on. Um, and then the only other thing was um, f the parking thing and really trying to figure out, like, in the incentivizations, like, is there, can we incentivize parking in developments that can be rented or traded for the events? And I don't know what that looks like, but it's worth having a study session on, on creative problem solving there, so. Um, okay, that's probably, and also I think that, I'm, I mean, I am fully behind your comments um, to add to this and, and exploring these things, 
I don't know that I'll agree with them once we get the information back, but I'm, I'm, you have my consensus. So thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Now, with all oh, that I have one more time. thing I want to include. Sorry, I forgot. But the planning part is, is it's also really important to factor in what we're going to do about materials and what we want it to look like, not just what we want the street sizes to look like, because I think we're also seeing that come across our table quite a bit, is that the, the choices that are being made right now, we, I, I'm not convinced are gonna stand the test of time. And I feel like if this is gonna be another leg of downtown, we wanna make sure that we can all agree that 100 years from now that we feel good about what we've what we've built and I feel like we've done a good job of that so far in our downtown and it's a right on the edge right now so Councilmember Bruner you had an additional comment thank you um I just I don't know if um all from all the comments it's clear with the direction um but I wanted to kind of state it clearly for direction to have um there's a need for data and um, to accompany this plan each time it moves forward in its phase. And the data, I know we were given last year around housing element, maybe, um, I don't remember when, but data of the housing um, uh, sizes needed. There was, you know, there's data about the migration cycles of a person's lifetime and the housing migration needs and um, our aging population and um, the data we've recently received about seniors and and so how many studios are needed and even a studio could be a couple or one person how many family sized housing is needed and there was some data from many different sources including the housing authority of Santa Cruz County and so I think those data needs um, around housing needs have to accompany this moving forward if that wasn't clear. And then um, data of existing commercial and residential, we heard tonight concerns of displacement. So um, displacement of commercial and residential information of about protections. Each time this plan is presented, someone listening might be in fear, as we heard tonight. And so how do we um, make sure we're addressing that and, and, and conveying that, hey, community, we, we have you in mind, too. And here's what we know so far, and here are the protections so far, just so someone um, doesn't feel like they're not part of the plan. And um, that displacement information would be really um, helpful. And then the data on the existing new developments, um, Anton, Nanda, 555 Pacific, you know, everything that's around that's new, the new library affordable housing project, um, and the leasing data too, the occupancy, the leasing data, all of that. I know it's a lot, but I think it's helpful context so that we're not looking at this as one piece. It's part of a fabric, and um, it's important information to help inform so we can make informed decisions, and the community can make informed input and informed decisions. Um, so um, I hope that direction is clear moving forward with, with this plan. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Butler, Ms. Van Waugh, uh, do you need any clarification from a commissioner or a council member as to what they want by way of, of, of providing you with input and what they're hoping to see back? Do you need clarification? All right, fair enough. Uh, thank you, planning staff. Thank you, clerk staff, for being here this evening. Economic development, planning staff, thank you all very, very much. Our consultants, thank you very much. Uh, this is the beginning of a lot of input on this document. Uh, you can go to the city's website at the planning department and see where you can continue to provide input until July the 10th. 
Is that correct? Till close of business on July the 10th. You can send emails, you can send texts, you can send, well, I don't know that you can send texts. You can send emails, you can send snail mail, you can do lots of things. Please do participate. There will be many other opportunities for participation in this very compound complex uh, project. Uh, with that, uh, the vice mayor, with deep reluctance and, and choking back tears, <laughs> moves to adjourn and uh, council member, who would, who would be, uh, council, I would give it to you. extreme <laughs> equal <laughs> reluctance, <laughs> council extreme member Watkins seconds, non-debatable, those in favor signify by saying aye, opposed, aye. motion aye. carries and so ordered, thank you all for being here. Yeah. Nice. Thank you for all your work, like, I know, yeah, but I'm yeah, so excited, no. like, I'm so excited, 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 I'